Kate Chopin, The Kiss. It was still quite light outdoors, but inside, with the curtains drawn and the smoldering fire sending out a dim, uncertain glow, the room was full of deep shadows. Brantine sat in one of these shadows. It had overtaken him, and he did not mind. The obscurity lent him courage to keep his eyes fastened as ardently as he liked upon the girl who sat in the firelight. She was very handsome with a certain fine, rich coloring that belongs to the healthy brune type. She was quite composed as she idly stroked the satiny coat of the cat that laid curled up in her lap, and she occasionally sent a slow glance into the shadows where her companion sat. They were talking low of indifferent things which plainly were not the thing that occupied their thoughts. She knew that he loved her. A frank, blustering fellow without guile enough to conceal his feelings, and no desire to do so. For two weeks past he had sought her society, eagerly and persistently. She was confidently waiting for him to declare himself, and she meant to accept him. The rather insignificant and unattractive Brantine was enormously rich, and she would like and required the entourage which wealth could give her. During one of the pauses between their talk in the last tea and the next reception, the door opened and a young man entered whom Brantine knew quite well. The girl turned her face towards him. A stride or two brought him to her side, and bending over the chair, before she could suspect his intention, for she did not realize that he had not seen her visitor, he pressed an ardent, lingering kiss upon her lips. Brantine slowly rose, so did the girl arise, but quickly, and the newcomer stood between them, a little amusement and some defiance struggling with the confusion in his face. I, I, I believe, stammered Brantine. I, I see I have stayed too long. I had no idea this is, I must wish you goodbye. He was clutching his hat with both hands and probably did not perceive that she was extending her hand to him. Her presence of mind had not completely deserted her, but she could not have trusted herself to speak. Hang me if I saw him sitting there, Natty. I know it's deuce awkward for you, but I hope you'll forgive me this once, this very first break. Why, what's the matter? Don't touch me. Don't come near me, she returned angrily. What do you mean by entering the house without ringing? I came with your brother, as I often do, he answered coldly, in self-justification. We came in the sideway. He went upstairs, and I came in here hoping to find you. The explanation is simple enough, and ought to satisfy you that the misadventure was unavoidable. But do say you forgive me, Natalie, he entreated, softening. Forgive you? You don't know what you're talking about. Let me pass. It depends upon a good deal on whether I'll ever forgive you. At the next reception, which she and Brantine had been talking about, she approached the young man with a delicious frankness of manner when she saw him there. Will you let me speak to you a moment or two, Mr. Brantine? She asked with an engaging but perturbed smile. He seemed extremely unhappy, but when she took his arms and walked away with him, seeking a retired corner, a ray of hope mingled with the almost comical misery of his expression. She was apparently very outspoken. Perhaps I should not have sought this interview, Mr. Brantine, but, but, oh, I have been very uncomfortable, almost miserable, since that last encounter the other afternoon, when I thought how you might have misinterpreted it and believed things. Hope was plainly gaining the ascendancy over misery in Brantine's round, guileless face. Of course, I know it's nothing to you, 
but for my own sake I do want you to understand that Mr. Harvey is an intimate friend of long standing. What? We have always been like cousins. Like brothers and sisters, I may say. He is my brother's most intimate associate, and often fancies that he is entitled to the same privileges as the family. Oh, I know it is absurd, uncalled for, to tell you this, undignified even. She was almost weeping. But it makes so much difference to me, what you think, well, of, of me. Her voice had grown very low and agitated. The misery had all disappeared from Brantine's face. Then you do really care what I think, Miss Natalie? M may I call you Miss Natalie? They turned into a long, dim corridor that was lined on either side with tall, graceful plants. They walked slowly to the very end of it. When they turned to retrace their steps, Brantine's face was radiant and hers was triumphant. Harvey was amongst the guests at the wedding, and he sought her out in a rare moment when she stood alone. Your husband, he said, smiling, has sent me over to kiss you. A quick blush suffused her face and round, polished throat. I suppose it's natural for a man to feel and act generously on an occasion of this kind. He tells me he doesn't want his marriage to interrupt wholly that pleasant intimacy which has existed between you and me. I don't know what you've been telling him. With an insolent smile. But he has sent me here to kiss you. She felt like a chess player who, by the clever handling of his pieces, seized the game taking the course intended. Her eyes was bright and tender with a smile as they glanced up into his, and her lips looked hungry for the kiss which they invited. But you know, he went on quietly, I didn't tell him so. It would have seemed ungrateful, but I can tell you. I have stopped kissing women. It is dangerous. Well, she had Brantine and his millions left. A person can't have everything in this world, and it was a little unreasonable of her to expect it. The end of that funny little tale. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The Disintegration Machine. The Disintegration Machine. Professor Challenger was in the worst possible humor. As I stood at the door of his study, my hand upon the handle and my foot upon the mat, I heard a monologue which ran like this, the words booming and reverberating throughout the house. Yes, I say it's the second call, the second call in one morning. Do you imagine that a man of science is to be distracted from essential work by the constant interference of some idiot at the end of a wire? I will not have it. Send this instant for the manager. Oh, you are the manager. Well, then why don't you manage? Yes, yes, certainly. Manage to distract me from work the importance of which your mind is incapable of understanding. I want the superintendent. He is away. Oh, I should imagine. I will carry you to the law courts if this occurs again. Crying cocks have been adjudicated upon. I myself have obtained a judgment. If crying cocks, why not jingling bells? The case is clear. A written apology. Very good. I will consider it. Good day. It was at this point I ventured to make my entrance. It was certainly an unfortunate moment. I confronted him as he turned from the telephone, a lion in his wrath. His huge black beard was bristling. His great chest was heaving with indignation, and his arrogant gray eyes swept me up and down as the backwash of his anger fell upon me. Infernal, idle, overpaid rascals, he boomed. I could hear them laughing as I was making my just complaints. There is a conspiracy to annoy me. And now, young Malone, 
you arrived to complete a disastrous morning. Are you here, may I ask, on your own account, or has your rag commissioned you to obtain an interview? As a friend, you are privileged. As a journalist, you are outside the pale. I was hunting in my pocket for Mark Ardle's letter when suddenly some new grievance came into his memory. His great hairy hands fumbled about among the papers upon his desk and finally extracted a press cutting. "'You have been good enough to allude to me in one of your recent lucubrations,' he said, shaking the paper at me. "'It was in the course of your somewhat fascist remarks concerning the recent Saurian remains discovered in the Solenhofen slates. You began a paragraph with the words, Professor G. E. Challenger, who is amongst our greatest living scientists. Well, sir, I asked, why these individuals' qualifications and limitations? Perhaps you can mention who these other predominant scientific men may be to whom you impute equality, or possibly superiority to myself. It was badly worded. I should certainly have said our greatest living scientist. I admitted <laughs> it was, after all, my own honest belief. And my words turned winter into summer. My dear young friend, do not imagine that I am exacting, but surrounded as I am by pugnacious and unreasonable colleagues, one is forced to take one's own part. Self-assertion is forged into my nature, but I have to hold my ground against opposition. Come now, sit here. What is the reason for your visit? I had to tread warily, for I knew how easy it was to set the lion roaring once again. I opened MacArdle's letter. May I read you this, sir? It is from MacArdle, my editor. I remember the man... Not an unfavorable specimen of his class. He has, at least, a very high admiration of you. He has turned to you again and again when he needed the highest qualities in some investigation. That is the case now. What does he desire? Challenger plumed himself like some unwieldy bird under the influence of flattery. He sat down with his elbows upon his desk his gorilla hands clasped together, his beard bristling forward, and his big gray eyes, half covered by his drooping lids, fixed benignly upon me. He was huge in all that he did, and his benevolence was even more overpowering than his truculence. I will read you his note to me, he says. Please call upon your esteemed friend, Professor Challenger, and ask for his cooperation in the following circumstances. There is a Latvian gentleman named Theodore Nemor living at White Fair's Mansions, Hampstead, who claims to have invented a machine of most extraordinary character, which is capable of disintegrating any object placed within its sphere of influence. Matter dissolves and returns to its molecular or atomic condition. By reversing the process, it can be reassembled. The claim seems to be an extravagant one, and yet there is solid evidence that there is some basis for it, and that this man has stumbled upon some remarkable discovery. I need not enlarge upon the revolutionary character of such an invention, nor of its extreme importance as a potential weapon of war a force which could disintegrate a battleship or turn a battalion, if it were only for a time, into a collection of atoms, would dominate the world. For social and for political reasons, not an instant is to be lost in getting to the bottom of the affair. The man courts publicity as he is anxious to sell his invention, so that there is no difficulty in approaching him. The enclosed card will open his doors. What I desire is that you and Professor Challenger call upon him, inspect his invention, and write for the Gazette a considered report upon the value of the discovery. I expect to hear from you tonight. R. McArdle There are my instructions, Professor, I added, as I refolded the letter. 
I sincerely hope that you will come with me, for how can I, with my limited capacities, act alone in such a matter? True, Malone, true, poured the great man. Though you are by no means destitute of natural intelligence, I agree with you that you would be somewhat overweighted in such a matter as you lay before me. Those unutterable people upon the telephone have already ruined my morning's work, so a little more can hardly matter. I am engaged in answering that Italian buffoon Masadi, whose views upon the larval development of the tropical termites have excited my derision and contempt, but I can leave the complete exposure of the impostor until evening. Meanwhile, I am yours at service. And thus it came about that on that October morning I found myself in the deep level tube with Professor speeding to the north of London in what proved to be one of the most singular experiences of my life. I had, before leaving Enmore Gardens, ascertained by the much-abused telephone that our man was at home and had warned him of our coming. He lived in a comfortable flat in Hampstead, and he kept us waiting for quite half an hour in an ante-room, whilst he carried on an animated conversation with a group of visitors, whose voices, as they finally bade farewell in the hall, showed that they were Russians. I caught a glimpse of them through the half-open door, and had a passing impression of prosperous and intelligent men with astrakhan collars to their coats, glistening top hats, and every appearance of that bourgeois well-being which the successful communist so readily assumes. The hall door closed behind them, and the next instant Theodore Nemar entered our apartment. I can see him now as he stood with the sunlight fall upon him, rubbing his long, thin hands together and surveying us with his broad smile and his cunning yellow eyes. He was a short, thick man with some suggestion of deformity in his body, though it was difficult to say where the suggestion lay. One might say that he was a hunchback without the hump. His large, soft face was like an underdone dumpling, of the same color and moist consistency, while the pimples and blotches which adorned it stood out the more aggressively against the pallid background. His eyes were those of a cat, and cat-like was the thin, long, bristling moustache above his loose, wet, slobbering mouth. It was all low and repulsive until one came to the sandy eyebrows. From these upwards there was a splendid carnial arch such as I have seldom seen. Even Challenger's hat might have fitted the magnificent head. One might read Theodore Nemour as a vile, crawling conspirator below, but above he might take rank with the greatest thinkers and philosophers of the world. Well, gentlemen, said he in a velvety voice, with only the least trace of a foreign accent, you have come, as I understand, from our short chat over the wires, in order to learn more of the Nemur disintegrator. Is that so? Exactly. May I ask whether you are the British government? Not at all. I am a correspondent from the Gazette, and this is Professor Challenger. An honored name, a European name. His yellow fangs gleamed in obsequious amiability. I was about to say that the British government has lost its chance. What else it has lost, it may find out later. Perhaps its empire as well. I was prepared to sell to the first government which gave me its price, and it has now fallen into the hands of which you may disapprove. You have only yourselves to blame. Then you have sold your secret. At my own price. You think the purchaser will have a monopoly? Undoubtedly he will. But others know the secret as well as you. No, sir. He touched his great forehead. This is the safe in which the secret is kept. A better safe than any of steel, and secured by something better than a Yale key. 
Some may know one side of the matter, others may know another. No one in the whole world knows the whole matter save I. And these gentlemen to whom you have sold it? No, sir, I am not so foolish as to hand over the knowledge until the price is paid. After that, it is I whom they buy, and they move this safe, he again tapped his brow, with all its content to whatever point they desire. My part of the bargain will then be done, faithfully, ruthlessly done. After that, history will be made. He rubbed his hands together, and the fixed smile upon his face twisted itself into something like a snarl. "'You will excuse me, sir,' boomed Challenger, who had sat in silence up till now, but whose expressive face registered most complete disapproval of Theodore Nemour. "'We should wish, before we discuss the matter, to convince ourselves that there is a matter to discuss.' We have not forgotten the recent case where an Italian who proposed to explode mines from a distance proved upon investigation to be an errant impostor. History may well repeat itself. You will understand, sir, that I have a reputation to sustain as a man of science, a reputation which you have been good enough to describe as European, though I have every reason to believe that it is not less conspicuous in America. Caution is a scientific attribute, and you must show us your proofs before we can seriously consider your claims. Nemer cast a particularly malignant glance from the yellow eyes at my companion, but the smile of affected geniality broadened upon his face. You live up to your reputation, Professor. I had always heard that you were the last man in the world who would be deceived. I am prepared to give you an actual demonstration which cannot fail to convince you, but before we proceed to that, I must say a few words upon the general principle. You will realize that the experimental plant which I have erected here in my laboratory is a mere model, though within its limits it acts most admirably. There would be no possible difficulty, for example, in disintegrating and reassembling you. But it is not for such a purpose as that that a great government is prepared to pay a price which runs into millions. My model is a mere scientific toy. It is only when the sum force is invoked upon a large scale that enormous practical effects could be achieved. May we see this model? You will not only see it, Professor Challenger but you will have the most conclusive demonstration possible upon your own person, if you have the courage to submit to it. If, the lion began to roar, your if, sir, is in the highest degree offensive. Well, well, I had no intention to dispute your courage. I will only say that I will give you an opportunity to demonstrate it, but I would first say a few words upon the underlying laws which governs the matter. When certain crystals, salt, for example, or sugar, are placed in water, they dissolve and disappear. You would not know that they have ever been there. Then, by evaporation or otherwise, you lessen the amount of water, and lo, there are the crystals again, visible once more and the same as before. Can you conceive a process by which you, an organic being, are in the same way dissolved into the cosmos, and then, by a subtle reversal of the conditions, reassembled once more? The analogy is a false one, cried Challenger. Even if I make so monstrous an admission as that our molecules could be dispersed by some disrupting power, why should they reassemble in the exact same order as before? The objection is an obvious one, and I can only answer that they do reassemble down to the last atom of the structure. There is an invisible framework, and every brick flies into its true place. You may smile, Professor, but your incredulity and your smile may soon be replaced by quite another emotion. 
Challenger shrugged his shoulders. I am quite ready to submit to the test. There is another case which I should impress upon you, gentlemen, on which may help you grasp the idea. You have heard both in Oriental magic and in Western occultism of the phenomenon of the apport when some object is suddenly brought from a distance and appears in a new place. How can such a thing be done save by the loosening of the molecules, their conveyance upon an electric wave, and their reassembling, each exactly in its own place, drawn together by some irresistible law? That seems a fair analogy to that which is done by my machine. You cannot explain one incredible thing by another incredible thing, said Challenger. I do not believe in your apports, Mr. Nemore, and I do not believe in your machine. My time is valuable, and if we are to have any sort of demonstration, I would beg you to proceed with it without further ceremony. Then you will be pleased to follow me, said the inventor. He led us down the stair to a flat across a small garden which lay behind. There was a considerable outhouse which he unlocked and we entered. Inside was a large whitewashed room with innumerable copper wires hanging in festoons from the ceilings and a huge magnet balanced upon a pedestal. In front of this was what looked like a prism of glass, three feet in length and about a foot in diameter. To the right of it was a chair which rested upon a platform of zinc and which had a burnished copper cap suspended above it. Both the cap and the chair had heavy wires attached to them. And the side was a sort of ratchet with numbered slots and a handle covered with India rubber which lay at present in the slot marked zero. Nemours Disintegrator Machine said the strange man, waving his hand towards the machine. This is the model which is designed to be famous as altering the balance of power among the nations. Who holds this rules the world. Now, Professor Challenger, you have, if I may say so, treated me with some lack of courtesy and consideration in this matter. Will you dare to sit upon that chair and to allow me to demonstrate upon your own body the capabilities of this new force. Challenger had the courage of a lion, and anything in the nature of a defiance roused him in an instant to a frenzy. He rushed at the machine, but I seized his arm and held him back. You shall not go, I said. Your life is too valuable. It is monstrous. What possible guarantee of safety have you? The nearest approach to that apparatus which I have ever seen was an electrocution chair at Sing Sing. My guarantee of safety, said Challenger, is that you are a witness and that this person would certainly be held for manslaughter at the least should anything befall me. That would be a poor consolation to the world of science when you would leave work unfinished which none but you can do. Let me at least go first. Then... When the experiments have proved harmless, you can follow. Personal danger would never have moved Challenger, but the idea that his scientific work might remain unfinished, that hit him hard. He hesitated, and before he could make up his mind, I had dashed forward and jumped into the chair. I saw the inventor put his hand on the handle. I was aware of a click. Then, for a moment, there was a sensation of confusion and mist before my eyes. Then they cleared. The inventor, with his odious smile, was standing before me, and Challenger, with his apple-red cheeks drained of blood and color, was staring over his shoulder. Well, get on with it, said I. It is all over. You responded admirably, Nemo replied. Step out, and Professor Challenger will now, no doubt, be ready to take his turn. I have never seen my old friend so utterly upset. His iron nerve had for a moment completely failed him. He grasped my arm with a shaking hand. My God, Malone, it's true, said he. You've 
vanished. There is not a doubt of it. There was a mist for an instant and then vacancy. How, how long was I away? Two or three minutes. I was, I confess, horrified. I could not imagine that you would return. Then he clicked his lever, if it is a lever, into a new slot, and there you were upon the chair, looking a little bewildered, but otherwise the same as ever. I thank God for the sight of you. He mopped his moist brow with his big red handkerchief. Now, sir, said the inventor, or perhaps your nerves have failed you. Challenger visibly braced himself. Then, pushing my protesting hand to one side, he seated himself upon the chair. The handle clicked into number three, and he was gone. I should have been horrified, but for the perfect coolness of the operator. It is an interesting process, is it not? He remarked. When one considers the tremendous individuality of the professor, it is strange to think that he is at present a molecular cloud suspended in some portion of this building. He is now, of course, entirely at my mercy. If... I choose to leave him in suspension. There is nothing on earth to prevent me. I should very soon find means to prevent you. The smile once again became a snarl. You cannot imagine that such a thought ever entered my mind. Good heavens, think of the permanent dissolution of the great Professor Challenger, vanished into cosmic space and left no trace. Terrible, terrible. At the same time, he has not been as courteous as he might. Don't you think some small lesson? No, I don't. Well, we shall call it a curious demonstration. Something that would make an interesting paragraph in your paper. For example, I have discovered that the hair of the body, being on an entirely different vibration to the living organic tissues, can be included or excluded at will. It would interest me to see the bear without his bristles. Behold him. There was the click of the lever. An instant later, Challenger was seated upon his chair once more. But what a challenger! What a shorn lion! Furious as I was at the trick he had been played upon, I could hardly keep from roaring with laughter. His huge beard was as bald as a baby's, and his chin was as smooth as a girl's. Bereft of his glorious mane, the lower part of his face was heavily jowled and ham-shaped, while his whole appearance was that of an old fighting gladiator, battled and bulging, with the jaws of a bulldog over a massive chin. It may have been some look upon our faces. I have no doubt that the evil grin of my companion had widened at the sight, but however that may be, Challenger's hand flew up to his head, and he became conscious of his condition. The next instance, he had sprung out of his chair, seized the inventor by the throat, and hurled him into the ground. Knowing Challenger's immense strength, I was convinced that the man would be killed. For God's sakes, be careful! If you kill him, we can never get matters right again, I cried. That argument prevailed. Even in his maddest moments, Challenger was always open to reason. He sprang up from the floor, dragging the trembling inventor with him. I give you five minutes, he panted in his fury. Five minutes! If I am not as I was, I will choke the life out of your wretched little body. Challenger, in a fury, was not a safe person to argue with. The bravest man might shrink from him, and there was no signs that Mr. Nemer was a particularly brave man. On the contrary, those blotches and warts upon his face had suddenly become much more conspicuous as the face behind them changed from the color of putty, which was normal, to that of a fish's belly. His limbs were shaking, and he could hardly articulate. Really, Professor? He babbled with his hand to his throat, 
This violence is quite unnecessary. Surely a harmless joke may pass among friends. It was my wish to demonstrate the powers of the machine. I had imagined that you wanted a full demonstration. No offense, I assure you, Professor, none in the world. For answer, Challenger climbed back into the chair. You will keep your eye upon him, Malone. Do not permit any liberties. I'll see to it, sir. Now then, set the matter straight or face the consequences. The terrified inventor approached his machine. The reuniting power was turned onto the full, and in an instant, there was the old lion with his tangled mane once more. He stroked his beard affectionately with his hands and passed them over his cranium to make sure that the restoration was complete. Then he descended solemnly from his perch. You have taken a liberty, sir, which might have had very serious consequences to yourself. However, I am contempt to accept your explanation that you only did it for purpose of demonstration. Now, may I ask you a few direct questions upon this remarkable power which you claim to have discovered? I am ready to answer save what the source of the power is. That is my secret. And do you seriously inform us that none in the world except yourself know it? No. No one has the last inkling. No assistant? No, sir. I work alone. Dear me, that is most interesting. You have satisfied me as to the reality of the power, but I do not yet perceive its practical bearings. I have explained, sir, that this is a model. But it would be quite easy to erect a plant upon a larger scale. You understand that this acts vertically. Certain currents above you and certain below you set up vibrations which either disintegrate or reunite. But the process could be lateral. If it were so concluded, it would have the same effect and cover a space in proportion to the strength of the current. Give an example. We will suppose that one pole is on one small vessel and one in another. A battleship between them would simply vanish into molecules and also a column of troops. And you have sold this secret as a monopoly to a single European power? Yes, sir, I have. When the money is paid over, they will have such power as no nation has ever had. You don't even now see the full possibilities if placed in capable hands, hands which did not fear to wield the weapon which they held. They are innumerable. A gloating smile passed over the man's evil face. Conceive a quarter of London in which such machines have been erected. Imagine the effect of such a current upon the scale which could easily be adopted. Why? He burst into laughter. I could imagine the whole Thames Valley being swept clean. Not one man, woman, or child left. Of all those teeming millions. The words filled me with horror, and even more the air of exultation with which they were pronounced. They seemed, however, to produce quite a different effect upon my companion. To my surprise, he broke into a genial smile and held out his hand to the inventor. Well, Mr. Nemor, I have to congratulate you he said. There is no doubt that you have come upon a remarkable property of nature which you have succeeded in harnessing for the use of man. That this use should be destructive is no doubt very deplorable, but science knows no distinction of the sort, but follows knowledge wherever it may lead. Apart from the principle involved, you have, I suppose, no objection to my examining the construction of the machine. None in the least. The machine is merely the body. It is the soul of it, the animating principle, which you can never hope to capture. Exactly. But the mere mechanism seems to be a model of ingenuity. 
For some time he walked round it and fingered its several parts. Then he hoisted his unwieldy bulk into the isolated chair. Would you like another excursion into the cosmos? asked the inventor. Later, perhaps, later. But meanwhile there is, as no doubt you know, some leakage of electricity. I can distinctly feel a weak current passing through me. Impossible! It is quite insulated. But I assure you I feel it. He levered himself down from his perch. The inventor hastened to take his place. I can feel nothing. Is there not a tingling down your spine? No, sir, I do not observe it. There was a sharp click, and the man had disappeared. I looked with amazement at Challenger. Good heavens, did you touch the machine, Professor? He smiled at me benignly with the air of a mild surprise. Dear me, I have inadvertently touched the handle, he said. One is very liable to have awkward incidents with a rough model of this kind. This lever should certainly be guarded. It is in number three. That is the slot which causes disintegration. So I observed when he demonstrated on you. But I was so excited when he brought you back that I did not see which was the proper slot for return. Did, did you notice it? I may have noticed it, young Malone, but I do not burden my mind with small details. There are many slots, and we do not know their purpose. We may make the matters worse if we experiment with the unknown. Perhaps it is better to leave things as they are. And you would? Exactly. It is better so. The interesting personality of Mr. Theodore Nemour has disturbed it itself throughout the cosmos. His machine is worthless, and a certain foreign government has been deprived of knowledge by which much harm might have been wrought. Not a bad morning's work, young Malone. Your rag will no doubt have an interesting column upon the inexplicable disappearance of a Latvian inventor shortly after the visit of his own special correspondent. I have enjoyed the experience. These are the lighter moments which come to brighten the dull routine of study. But life has its duties as well as its pleasures, and I now return to the Italian Masati and his preposterous views upon the larval development of the tropical termites. Looking back, it seemed to me that a slight oleaginous mist was still hovering round the chair. But surely, I urged. The first duty of a law-abiding citizen is to prevent murder, said Professor Challenger. I have done so. Enough, Malone, enough. The theme it will not bear discussion. It has already disengaged my thoughts too long from matters of more importance. The end. Guide him up a song. This one is called Love. Love. Being pages from a sportsman's notebook. I have just been reading in a newspaper the story of a love tragedy. He killed her, then he killed himself, therefore he loved her. What do he or she signify to me? Alone, it is only their love that matters. And it does not interest me in the least because it touches me, or because it amazes me, or because it moves me, or because it makes me think, but only because it brings back to my mind a memory of the days of my youth, a curious sporting experience, when love shone out before me like crosses used to shine in the sky for early Christians. I have by nature within me all the instincts and feelings of primitive man, tempered by the humaner understanding of civilized being. I am passionately devoted to sport, but the bleeding victim, the blood on the feathers of a bird, harrow my feelings and almost make me faint with horror. 
About the end of the autumn of the year I have in mind, the cold weather suddenly set in, and I was invited by one of my cousins, Carl de Roville, to shoot duck with him at daybreak over the marshes. My cousin, a jolly red-headed and big-bearded, immensely powerful fellow of forty, a lively and likable sort of beast, who had within him just that pinch of attic salt which makes mediocrity tolerable, lived the life of a country gentleman in a house which was half farm, half mansion, in a broad valley through which a river floated. Woods covered the hills on either side, ancient ancestral woods with magnificent trees, in which were to be found more rare examples of game birds than in any other district close by. Sometimes eagles were shot, and birds flying south, which hardly ever came near over populated parts of the country, almost invariably used to break their journey when they came to these countries' old trees, as if they knew and saw once more a little corner of a very old forest, which still existed to give them shelter through their short night's rest. The valley was covered with huge pastures, irrigated by ditches and divided by hedges, the river, narrow at first, spread out at some little distance away into an immense marsh. This marsh, the best bit of the shooting I've ever known, was my cousin's very special care, and he looked after it as he would a park. Narrow avenues had been cut through the great masses of reeds which covered it and whose rustling and swaying seemed to make it alive and along these passages floated fat-bottomed boats, propelled and steered with poles, silently passed over the still water, gazing the rushes, while fishes darted through the weeds, and windfowl, with their black and pointed heads, dived and vanished in a flash. I love water passionately and wholeheartedly. The sea, although it is too vast, too turbulent, impossible to call one's own, Rivers, which are so pretty, but which hurry by and vanish forever, but above all the water of marshes, in which there throbs all the unknown lives of birds, beasts, and fishes. A marsh is a world of its own upon this earth of ours, a different world. With its own habits, its fixed population, and its people who come and go, its voices, its sounds, its essentiality, its mystery. There is at times nothing more disturbing, more disquieting, more terrifying than Bogland. Whence comes this fear which hovers over the low-lying tracts of lands covered with water? Is it in the whispering of the reeds, the will-o'-the-wisps? the deep silence in which they are wrapped on still nights, or the fantastic mists which cover the rushes as with a shroud, or the barely noticeable noises, so light, so gentle, yet at times more terrifying than the thunder of man and God. Do these give marshes the appearance of some dreamland or of some dread country which hides some secret harmful and not to be known by mortal man. No, something else stands forth clearly. Another and deeper, more solemn mystery is floating in those dense mists, perhaps even the mystery of creation. For did not the first germ of life stir and become restless and come into being in stagnant and muddy water in the heavy damp and land streaming under the burning sun. I arrived at my cousin's house in the evening. It was freezing hard enough to split stones. During dinner in the great hall, whose sideboards, walls, and ceilings were all covered with stuffed birds with outstretched wings or perched upon branches, hawks, herons, owls, nightjars, buzzards, vultures, falcons, my cousin, himself, like some strange animal of the Arctic region, in his sealskin jacket, put before me all the plans he had made for this very night. We were to leave at half-past three in the morning as to arrive about half-past four at the place chosen for our shooting expedition. 
At this place a hut had been constructed out of blocks of ice to shelter us a little from the terrible wind which rises just before dawn, that wind laden with an iciness which tears one's flesh as with a saw, cuts it with the blade of a sword, pricks it as with poison goads, twists it as with red-hot pincers, and scorches it as with fire. My cousin, rubbing his hands, said, I have never felt such frost. At six this evening, it was already twelve degrees below zero. Immediately after dinner, I threw myself on my bed and went off to sleep by the light of a great fire blazing in the grate. As three o'clock struck, I was awakened. I put on a sheepskin and found my cousin Carl clothed in a bearskin. After two cups of hot coffee and a couple of glasses of cognac, we set out with our gamekeeper and our dogs, Plajon and Pierrot. The moment I got outside, I felt frozen to the bone. It was one of those nights when the earth seemed to be frozen to death. The icy air rises before one as a veritable wall, which one can feel horribly and painfully. No breath of wind moves it. There it is, solid and immovable. It bites, pierces, withers, kills trees, plants, insects, even little birds which fall from the branches to the hard ground and themselves become hard in the embrace of the cold. The moon, in its last quarter, all pale, appeared to be dying in the mists of space, so weak that it could not move and was standing still upon there, paralyzed in the clutch of the bitter sky. It shed a thin and melancholy light upon the world below. The pale and dying beam which it casts every month as it wanes. With bent backs, hands in pockets, and guns over our arms, Carl and I strode along. Our boots, wrapped around with wool to prevent us slipping on the frozen brooks, made no noise. I noticed how our dog's breath turned to steam in the cold air. We soon reached the edge of the marsh, and we entered one of the avenues of dry reeds leading through the low forest. A soft sound came from the long ribbon-like leaves as we brushed them aside, and I was suddenly seized for the first time by the powerful and strange sensation which Boglands produced in me. This one was dead, frozen to death, for we were tramping over it through its forest of dried-up rushes. Suddenly, at the bend of one of the avenues, I saw the hut made of ice which had been set up as a shelter for us. I went in, and as we still had an hour to pass before the birds awakened, I rolled myself up in my sheepskin to keep the warm. Lying on my back, I began to watch the misshapen moon shining mistily through the transparent walls of the icy house, but the cold of the frozen marshland of those walls of earth and sky without soon went through me so horribly that I began to cough. My cousin Carl was alarmed. It will be a great nuisance if we don't shoot anything today, he said. I don't want you to catch a cold, so we must have a fire. He then ordered the gamekeeper to cut some reeds. They made a pile in the center of the hut with its top knocked off to let the smoke escape and as the red flame licked up the crystal-like walls, they began to melt, quietly, almost imperceptibly, just as if the ice bricks were sweating. Carl, who had remained outside, called to me, Come and look! I went out and stood for a moment completely lost in amazement. Our cone-shaped hut seemed like some enormous diamond with a heart of fire thrust suddenly onto the frozen marsh. Within there were seen two fantastical shapes, our dogs warming themselves. Then a strange, frightening, wandering cry was heard over our heads. Our fire was awakening the wildfowl. To me, there is nothing more affecting than the first cry of some absolutely invisible living thing 
hurrying through the dark air so swiftly and so far away, just before there appears on the horizon the earliest light of a winter's day. At that freezing hour of dawn, I can imagine that the faint cry borne on the wings of a bird's is a sigh escaping from the soul of the world. Carl said, Put out the fire. Dawn is breaking. Certainly the sky began to grow pale, and across it flocks of ducks made long, black, quickly disappearing streaks. A flash of light blazed through the darkness. Carl had just fired, and the dogs sped forwards. Then, no minute went by without one of us quickly taking aim as soon as the outline of some flying mass appeared above the reeds, and Perrault and Plajon, out of breath and happy, brought us bleeding creatures whose eyes sometimes still looked at us. Day broke, clear with blue sky. The sun came up over the bottom of the valley, and we were thinking of going home when two birds, with necks and wings outstretched, suddenly glided over our heads, and I fired. And one of them, a steel with a silver breast, fell almost at my feet. Then, high above me, a cry of the survivor of the two was heard, a little heart-rendering wail, which it uttered again and again. And the little creature began to circle round in the blue sky above us, watching its dead companion, which I was holding. Carl, on one knee, his gun at his shoulder, was watching it keenly, waiting till it came within range. You have killed the hen, he said. The cock won't go away. Indeed, it did not go away, but continued to circle and to cry piteously over our heads. Never has the groan of one in pain harrowed my heart so much as that call of distress. As that wail of reproach from the poor creature high up in the sky. Once or twice it fled as it saw the thread of the gun which followed its flight, and it seemed prepared to continue its journey across the sky all alone. Then, as if unable to make up its mind, it would instead return to look for its companion. Put the other one down, and it will return by and by, said Carl. In truth, it came back, indifferent to danger, maddened by its wild love for the creature which I had killed. Carl fired. It was as if the cord which was holding the bird above us had been cut, I saw a black thing come down. I heard the noise of its fall in the reeds, and Perrault brought it to me. I put the two, already cold, into the same bag, and went back to Paris that very day. The end. Anton Chekhov. This one is called The Beggar. Kind sir, have pity. Turn your attention to a poor hungry man. For three days I've had nothing to eat. I haven't five kopecks for a lodging. I swear it before God. For eight years I was a village school teacher, and then I lost my place through intrigues. I fell a victim to calumny. It is a year now since I've had anything to do. The advocate Scorso looked at the ragged, fawn-colored overcoat of the suppliant, at his dull, drunken eyes and the red spot on either cheeks, and it seemed to him as if he had seen this man somewhere before. I have now had an offer of a position in the province of Kaluga, the medicant went on, but I haven't the money to get there. Help me kindly, I am ashamed to ask, but I'm obliged by my circumstances. Skortskov's eyes fell on the man's overshoes, one of which was higher and the other low, and he suddenly remembered something. 
Look here. It seems to me I met you the day before yesterday in Sodovaya Street, he said. But you told me then that you were a student who had been expelled and not a village school teacher. Do you remember? No, no, that can't be so, mumbled the beggar, taken back. I am a village school teacher, and if you like, I can show you my papers. Have done with your lying. You called yourself a student and even told me what you had been expelled for. Don't you remember? Skortskov flushed and turned from the ragged creature with an expression of disgust. This is dishonesty, dear sir, he cried angrily. This is swindling. I shall send the police for you, damn you! Even if you are poor and hungry, that does not give you any right to lie blatantly and shamelessly. The waif caught hold of the door handle and looked furtively around for the antechamber like a detective thief. I, I, I am not lying, he muttered. I can show you my papers. Who would believe you? Skortsov continued indignantly. Don't you know that it's a low, dirty trick to exploit the sympathy which society feels for village school teachers and students? It is revolting! Skortsov lost his temper and began to berate Medikant unmercifully. The imprudent lying of the ragamuffin offended what he, Skortsov, most prided in himself his kindness, his tender heart, his compassion for all unhappy things. That lie and attempt to take advantage of the pity of its subject seemed to him to profane the charity which he liked to extend to the poor out of the purity of his heart. At first the wave continued to protest innocence, but soon he grew silent and hung his head in confusion. Sir, he said, laying his hand on his heart, the fact is, I was lying. I am neither a student nor a school teacher. All that was fiction. Formerly, I sang in a Russian choir and was sent away for drunkenness. But what else can I do? I can't get along without lying. No one will give me anything when I tell the truth. With truth, a man would starve to death or freeze to death without lodgings. You reason justly, I understand you, but what can I do? What can you do? You ask what can you do, cried Skorskov, coming close to him. Work, that's what you can do. You must work. Work, yes, I know that myself, but where can I find work? By God, you judge harshly, cried the beggar with a bitter laugh. Where can I find manual labor? It is too late for me to be a clerk, because in trade one has to begin as a boy. No one would ever take me for a porter because they couldn't order me about. No factor would have me, because for that one has to know the trade, and I know none. Nonsense! You always find some excuse. How would you like to chop wood for me? I wouldn't refuse that. But in these days, even skilled woodcutters find themselves sitting without bread. Hush! You loafers all talk that way. As soon as an offer is made you, you refuse it. Will you come and chop wood for me? Yes, sir, I will. Very well. We'll soon find out. Splendid. We'll see. Squirso hastened along, rubbing his hands, not without feeling malice, and called his cook out of the kitchen. Here, Olga, he said, take this gentleman into the woodshed and let him chop wood. The tattered scarecrow shrugged his shoulders 
as if in perplexity and went irresolutely after the cook. It was obvious from his gait that he had not consented to go and chop wood because he was hungry and wanted work, but simply from pride and shame. Because he had been trapped by his own words. It was obvious, too, that his strength had been undermined by vodka and that he was unhealthy and did not feel the slightest inclination for toil. Skortsov hurried into the dining room. From its window one could see the woodshed and everything that went on in the yard. Standing at the window, Skortsov saw the cook and the beggar come out into the yard by the back door and make their way across the dirty snow to the shed. Olga glared wrathfully at her companion, shoved him aside with her elbow, unlocked the shed, and angrily banged the door. We probably interrupted the woman over her coffee, thought Skorskov. What an ill-tempered creature! Next he saw the pseudo-teacher, pseudo-student, seat himself on a log and become lost in thought with his red cheeks resting in his fist. The woman flung down an axe at his feet, spat angrily, and judging from the expression of her lips, began to scold him. The beggar irresolutely pulled a billet of wood toward him, set it up between his feet, and tapped it feebly with the axe. The billet wavered and fell down. The beggar again pulled it to him, blew on his freezing hands, and tapped it with his axe cautiously, as if afraid of hitting his overshoe or of cutting off his finger. The stick of wood again fell to the ground. Skorskov's anger had vanished, and he now began to feel a little sorry and ashamed of himself for having set a spoiled, drunken, perchance sick man to work at menial labor in the cold. Well, never mind, he thought going into his study from the dining room. I did it for his own good. An hour later, Olga came in and announced that the wood had all been chopped. Good, give him half a rubble, said Skorskov. If he wants, he can come back and cut wood on the first day of each month. We can always find work for him. On the first day of the month, the waif made his appearance and again earned half a rouble although he could barely stand on his legs. From that day on, he often appeared in the yard, and every time work was found for him, now he would shovel snow, now put the woodshed in order, now beat the dust out of rugs and mattresses. Every time he received from twenty to forty kopecks, and once even a pair of old trousers was sent out to him. When Skorskov moved into another house, he hired him to help in the packing and hauling of the furniture. This time the waif was sober, gloomy, and silent. He hardly touched the furniture and walked behind the wagons hanging his head, not even making a pretense of appearing busy. He only shivered in the cold and became embarrassed when the carters jeered at him for his idleness, his feebleness, and his tattered fancy overcoat. After the moving was over, Skorsko sent for him. Well, I see that my words have taken effect, he said, handing him a rouble. Here's for your pains. I see you are sober and have no objection to work. What is your name? Lushkov. Well, Lushkov, I can offer you some other cleaner employment. Can you write? I can. Then, take this letter to a friend of mine tomorrow, and you will be giving some copying to do. Work hard, don't drink, and remember what I have said to you. Goodbye. Pleased of having put a man on the right path, Skorsko tapped Lushko kindly on the shoulder, and even gave him his hand at parting. Lushko took the letter, and from that day forth came no more to the yard for work. Two years went by. Then one evening, as Skorsko was standing at the ticket window of a theater paying for his seat, he noticed a little man beside him with a coat collar of curly fur 
and worn sealskin cap, this little individual timidly asked the ticket seller for a seat in the gallery and paid for it in copper coins. Lushkov, is that you? cried Skorskov, recognizing in the little man his former woodchopper. How are you? What are you doing? How is everything with you? All right. I am a notary now and get thirty-five rubles a month. Thank heaven, that's fine. I am delighted for your sake. I am very, very glad, Lushkov. You see, you are my godson, in a sense. I gave you a push along the right path, you know. Do you remember what a roasting I gave you, eh? I nearly had you sink into the ground at my feet that day. Thank you, old man, for not forgetting my words. Thank you, too, said Lushko. If I hadn't come to you then, I might still have been calling myself a teacher or a student to this day. Yes, by flying to your protection, I dragged myself out of a pit. I am glad, indeed. Thank you for your kind words and deeds. You talked splendidly to me then. I am very grateful to you and to your cook. God bless the good and noble woman. You spoke finely then, and I shall be indebted to you to my dying day. But strictly speaking, it was your cook, Olga, who saved me. How's that? Like this. When I used to come to your house to chop wood, she used to begin, Oh, you soot, you! Oh, you miserable creature! There's nothing for you but ruin! And then she would sit down opposite me and grow sad, looking into my face and weep. Oh, you unlucky man! There's no pleasure for you in the world, and there will be none in the world to come. You drunkard! You will burn in hell, oh, you unhappy one! And so she would carry on, you know, in that strain. I can't tell you how much misery she suffered, how many tears she shed for my sake. But the chief thing was, she used to chop the wood for me. Do you know, sir, that I did not chop one single stick of wood for you? She did it all. Why this saved me, why I changed, why I stopped drinking at the sight of her, I cannot explain. I only know that, owing to her words and noble deeds, a change took place in my heart. She set me right, and I will never forget it. However, it is time to go now. There goes the bell. Lushko bowed and departed to the gallery. The end. Catherine Mansfield. It is called Taking the Veil. It seemed impossible that anyone should be unhappy on such a beautiful morning. Nobody was, decided Edna, except herself. The windows were flung wide in the houses, from which there came the sound of pianos, little hands chased after each other and ran away from each other, practicing scales. The trees flurried in the sunny gardens, all bright with spring flowers. Street boys whistled, a little dog barked, people passed by, walking so lightly, so swiftly, they looked as if they wanted to break into a run. Now she actually saw in the distance a parasol, peach-colored, the first parasol of the year. Perhaps even Edna did not look quite as unhappy as she felt, it's not easy to look tragic at eighteen when you are extremely pretty with the cheeks and lips and shining eyes of perfect health. Above all, when you are wearing a French blue frock and your new spring hat trimmed with corn flowers. True, she carried under her arm a book in horrid black leather. Perhaps the book provided a gloomy note, but only by accident. It was the ordinary library binding, 
for Edna had made going to the library an excuse for getting out of the house to think, to realize what had happened, to decide somehow what was to be done now. An awful thing had happened. Quite suddenly, at the theater last night, when she and Jimmy were seated side by side in the dress circle, without a moment's warning, in fact, she had just finished a chocolate almond and passed the box to him again, she had fallen in love with an actor, but fallen in love. The feeling was unlike anything she had ever imagined before. It wasn't in the least pleasant. It was hardly thrilling. Unless you can call the most dreadful sensation of hopeless misery, despair, agony, and wretchedness thrilling. Combined with the certainty that if that actor had met her on the pavement after, while Jimmy was fetching their cab, she would follow him to the ends of the earth at a nod and a sign without giving another thought to Jimmy or her father or mother or her happy home and countless friends again. The play had begun fairly cheerfully. That was the chocolate almond stage. Then the hero had gone blind. Terrible moment. Edna had cried so much she had to borrow Jimmy's folded, smooth-feeling handkerchief as well. Not that crying mattered. Whole rows were in tears. Even the men blew their noses with a loud trumpeting noise and tried to peer at the program instead of looking at the stage. Jimmy, most mercifully dry-eyed, for what would he have done without his handkerchief, squeezed her free hand and whispered, Cheer up, darling girl. And it was then she had taken the last chocolate almond to please him and pass the box again. Then there had been that ghastly scene when the hero alone on the stage in a deserted room at twilight with a band playing outside and the sound of cheering coming from the street. He had tried, oh how painfully, how pitifully, he had tried to grope his way to the window. He had succeeded at last. There he stood holding the curtain while one beam of light, just one beam, shone full on his raised, sightless face, and the band faded away into the distance. It was really, it was absolutely, it was the most, it was simply, in fact, from that moment, Edna knew that life could never be the same. She drew her hand away from Jimmy's, leaned back, and shut the chocolate box forever. This, at last, was love. Edna and Jimmy were engaged. She had had her hair up for a year and a half. They had been publicly engaged for a year, but they had known they were going to marry each other ever since they walked in the botanical garden with their nurses and sat on the grass with a wine biscuit and a piece of barley sugar each for their tea. It was so much an accepted thing that Edna had worn a wonderfully good imitation of an engagement ring out of a cracker all the time she was in school. And up until now, they had been completely devoted to each other. But now it was over. It was so completely over that Edna found it difficult to believe that Jimmy didn't realize it too. She smiled wisely, sadly, as she turned into the garden of the convent of the Sacred Heart and mounted the path that led through them to Hill Street. How much better to know it now than to wait until after they were married. Now it was possible that Jimmy could get over it. No, it was no use deceiving herself. He would never get over it. His life was wrecked, was ruined. That was inedible. But he was young. Time, people always said. Time might make a little, just a little difference. In forty years, when he was an old man, he might be able to think of her calmly. 
perhaps. But she, what did the future hold for her? Edna had reached the top of the path. There, under a new leaf tree hung with little bunches of white flowers, she sat down on a green bench and looked over the convent flower beds. In one nearest to her, there grew tender stalks with a border of blue shell-like pansies, with one corner of a clump of creamy freesias, their light spears of green crisscrossed over the flowers. The convent pigeons were tumbling high in the air, and she could hear the voice of Sister Agnes, who was giving a singing lesson. Amen, sounded the deep tones of the nun, and amen, they were echoed. If she did not marry Jimmy, then of course she would not marry anyone. The man she was in love with, the famous actor, Edna had far too much common sense not to realize that that would never be. It was very odd. She did not even want it to be. Her love was too intense for that. It had to be endured silently. It had to torment her. It was, she supposed, simply that kind of love. But Edna, cried Jimmy, can you ever change? Can I never hope again? Oh, what sorrow to have to say it, but it must be said. No, Jimmy, I will never change. Edna bowed her head, and a little flower fell upon her lap, and the voice of Sister Agnes cried suddenly, Ah, no, and the echo came, Ah, no. At that moment, the future was revealed. Edna saw it all. She was astonished. It took her breath away at first. But after all, what could be more natural? She would go into a convent. Her father and mother do everything to dissuade her in vain. As for Jimmy, his state of mind hardly bears thinking about. Why can't they understand? How can they add to her suffering like this? The world is cruel, terribly cruel. After a last scene, when she gives away her jewelry and so on to her best friends, she's so calm, they so broken-hearted, into a convent she goes. No, one moment. The very evening of her going is the actor's last evening at Port Villain. He receives by a strange messenger a box. It is full of white flowers. But there is no name, no card, nothing? Yes, under the roses, wrapped in a white handkerchief, Edna's last photograph, with written underneath, The World Forgetting by the World Forgot. Edna sat very still under the trees. She clasped the black book in her fingers and thought it was her missile. She takes the name of Sister Angela, snip, snip. All her lovely hair is cut off. Will she be allowed to send one curl to Jimmy? It is contrived somehow. And in a blue gown with a white headband, Sister Angela goes from the convent to the chapel, from the chapel to the convent, with something unearthly in her look, in her sorrowful eyes and in the gentle smile with which they greet the little children who run to her, a saint. She hears it whispered as she paces the chill, wax-smelling corridors, a saint. And visitors to the chapel are told of the nun whose voice is heard above all the others, of her youth, of her beauty, and of her tragic, tragic love. There is a man in this town whose life is ruined. A big bee, a golden furry fellow, crept into a frisha, and the delicate flower leaned over, swung, shook, and when the bee flew away, it fluttered still as though it were laughing. Happy, careless flower. Sister Angela looked at it and said, Now it's winter. 
One night, lying in her icy cell, she hears a cry. Some stray animal is out there in the garden, a kitten or a lamb or, well, whatever little animal might be there. Up rises the sleepless nun. All in white, shivering but fearless, she goes and brings it in. But next morning, when the bell rings for matins, she is found tossing in high fever, in delirium, and she never recovers. In three days, all is over. The service has been said in the chapel, and she is buried in the corner of the cemetery reserved for the nuns, where there are plain little crosses of woods. Rest in peace, Sister Angela. Now it is evening. Two old people leaning on each other come slowly to the grave and kneeling down sobbing, Our daughter! Our only daughter! Now there comes another. He is all in black. He comes slowly. But when he is there and lifts his black hat, Edna sees to her horror his hair is now snow white. Jimmy! Too late! Too late! Tears running down his face, he is crying now, too late, too late. The wind shakes the leafless trees in the churchyard. He gives one awful bitter cry. Edna's black book fell with a thud to the garden path. She jumped up, her heart beating. My darling, no, it is not too late. It has all been a mistake, a terrible dream. Oh, that white hair, how could she have done it? She has not done it. Oh, heavens, oh, what happiness. She is free and young, and nobody knows her secret. Everything is still possible for her and Jimmy. The house they have planned may still be built, the little solemn boy with which hands behind his back watching them plant the standard roses may still be born, his baby sister. But when Edna goes as far as his baby sister, she stretched out her arms as though a little love came flying through the air to her and gazing at the garden, at the white sprays on the tree, at those darling pigeons blue against the blue, at the convent with its narrow windows, she realized that now, for the first time in her life, she had never imagined any feeling like it before. She knew what it was to be in love, but in love. The end. Kate Chopin, Fedora. Fedora had determined upon driving over to the station herself from Miss Melters. Though one or two of them looked disappointed, notably her brother, no one opposed her. She said the brute was restive and shouldn't be trusted to the handling of the young people. To be sure, Fedora was old enough from the standpoint of her sister Camilla and the rest of them. Yet no one would have thought of it but for her own persistent affectation and idiotic assumption of superior years and wisdom. She was thirty. Fedora had too early in life formed an ideal and treasured it. By this ideal she had measured such male beings as hitherto challenged her attention, and needless to say, she had found them wanting. The young people, her brothers and sisters' guests, who were constantly coming and going that summer, occupied her to a great extent, but failed to interest her. She concerned herself with their comforts in the absence of her mother, looked after their health and well-being, contrived for their amusements, in which she never joined. And, as Fedora was tall and slim and carried her head loftily, and wore eyeglasses and a severe expression, some of them, the silliest, felt as if she were a hundred years old. Young Malters thought she was about forty. One day, when he stopped before her out in the gravel walk to ask her some questions pertaining to the afternoon sport, Fedora, who was tall, 
had to look up into his face to answer him. She had known him eight years since he had been a lad of fifteen, and to her he had never been other than the lad of fifteen. But that afternoon, looking up into his face, the sudden realization came home to her that he was a man. In voice, in attitude, in bearing, in every sense, a man. In an absorbing glance and with an unaccountable intention, she gathered in every detail of his countenance as though it were a strange new thing to her, presenting itself to her vision for the first time. The eyes were blue, earnest, and at the moment a little troubled over some trivial affair that he was relating to her. The face was brown from the sun, smooth with no suggestion of ruddiness except in the lips. That were strong, firm, and clean. She kept thinking of his face and every trick of it after he passed on. From that moment he began to exist for her. She looked at him when he was nearby. She listened for his voice and took notice and account of what he said. She sought him out and selected him when occasion permitted. She wanted him by her, though his nearness troubled her. There was uneasiness, restlessness. There was redoubled uneasiness when he was nearby. There was an inward revolt, astonishment, rapture, self contumely a swift, fierce encounter betwixt thought and feeling. Fedora could hardly explain to her own satisfaction why she wanted to go herself to the station for young Malter's sister. She felt a desire to see the girl, to be near her, as unaccountable, when she tried to analyze it, as the impulse which drove her, and to which she often yielded, to touch his hat, hanging with the others upon the hall pegs when she passed it by. Once, a coat which she had discarded hung there too. She bared herself for an instant in the rough folds of the coat. Fedora reached the station a little before train time. It was in a pretty nook, green and fragrant, set down on the foot of the wooded hill. Off in a clearing there was a field of yellow grain, upon which the sinking sunlight fell in slantering broken beams. Far down the track there were some men at work, and the even ring of their hammers was the only sound that broke up the silence. Fedora loved it all. Sky and woods and sunlight, sounds and smells, but her bearing, elegant, composed, reserved, betrayed nothing emotional as she tramped the narrow platform, whip in hand, and occasionally offered a condescending word to the mailman or the sleepy agent. Malter's sister was the only soul to disembark from the train. Fedora had never seen her before, but if there had been a hundred, she would have known the girl. She was the small thing, but aside from that, there was the coloring, there was the blue earnest eyes, there above all was the firm, full curve of the lips, the same setting of the white, even teeth. There was the subtle play of feature, the elusive trick of expression, which she had thought particular and individual in the one, presenting themselves as family traits. The suggestive resemblance of the girl to her brother was vivid, poignant even to Fedora, realizing, as she did with a pang, that familiarity and custom would soon blur the image. Miss Malters was a quiet, reserved creature, with little to say. She had been to college with Camilla, and spoke somewhat of their friendship and former intimacy. She sat lower in the cart than Fedora, who drove, handing whip and rein with accomplished skill. You know, my dear child, said Fedora, in her usual elderly fashion, I want you to feel completely at home with us. They were driving through a long, quiet, leafy road into which the twilight was just beginning to creep. Come to me freely and without reserve, with all your wants, with any complaints. I feel that I shall be quite fond of you. She had gathered the reins into one hand 
and with the other free arm she encircled Mrs. Malter's shoulders. When the girl looked up into her face with murmured thanks, Fedora bent down and pressed a long, penetrating kiss upon her mouth. Malter's sister appeared astonished and not too well pleased. Fedora, with seemingly unruffled composure, gathered the reins and for the rest of the way stared steadily ahead of her between the horse's ears. The end of that funny little tale. The Talking Out of Tarrington Written by Saki or Hector Hugo Monroe. Heavens! exclaimed the aunt of Clovis. Here comes one I know bearing down on us. I can't remember his name, but he lunched with us once in town. Tarrington, yes, that's it. He's heard of the picnic I'm giving for the princess, and he'll cling to me like a life belt till I give him an invitation. Then he'll ask if he may bring all his wives and mothers and sisters with him. That's the worst of these small watering places. One can't escape from anybody. I'll fight a rearguard action for you, if you like to bolt now, volunteered Clovis. You have a clear ten-yard start if you don't lose time. The aunt of Clovis responded gamely to the suggestion and churned away like a Nile streamer with a long brown ripple Pekingese spaniel trailing in her wake. Pretend you don't know him, was her parting advice, tinged with the reckless courage of a non-combatant. The next moment, the overtures of an affably disposed gentleman was being received by Clovis with a silent upon a peak in Dorian stare which denoted an absence of all previous acquaintance with the object scrutinized. I expect you don't know me with my moustache, said the newcomer. I've only grown it during the last two months. On the contrary, said Clovis, the moustache is the only thing about you that seems familiar to me. I feel certain that I have met it somewhere before. My name is Charrington, resumed the candidate for recognition. A very useful kind of name, said Clovis. With a name of that sort, no one would blame you if you did nothing in particular heroic or remarkable, would they? And yet... If you were to raise a troop of light horse in a moment of national emergency, Tarrington's light horse would sound quite appropriate and pulse-quickening, whereas if you were called Spoopin, for instance, the thing would be out of the question. No one, not even in a moment of national emergency, would possibly belong to the Spoopin's horse. The newcomer smiled weakly, as one who is not to be put off by mere flippancy, and began again with patient persistence. I think you ought to remember my name. I shall, said Clovis, with an air of immense sincerity. My aunt was asking me only this morning to suggest names for four young owls she just had sent as her pets. I shall call them all Tarrington. Then, if one or two of them die or fly away or leave us in any of the ways that pet owls are prone to, there will be always one or two left to carry on your name. And my aunt won't let me forget it. She will always be asking, Have the Tarringtons had their mice and questions of that sort? She says if you keep wild creatures in captivity, you ought to see after their wants. And of course, she is quite right there. I met you at luncheon at your aunt's house once, broke in Mr. Tarrington, pale but still resolute. My aunt never lunches, said Clovis. She belongs to the National Anti-Luncheon League, which is doing quite a lot of good work in a quiet, unobtrusive way. A subscription of half a crown per quarter entitles you to go without ninety-two luncheons. This must be a new thing. 
exclaimed Harrington. It's the same aunt I've always had, said Clovis coldly. I perfectly well remember meeting you at a luncheon party given by your aunt, persisted Tarrington, who was beginning to flush an unhealthy shade of mottled pink. What was there for lunch? asked Clovis. Oh, well, I don't remember that. How nice of you to remember my aunt, when you can no longer recall the names of the things that you ate. Now my memory works quite differently. I can remember a menu long after I've forgotten the hostess that accompanied it. When I was seven years old, I recollect being given a peach at a garden party by some duchess or other. I can't remember a thing about her, except that I imagine our acquaintance must have been of the slightest, as she called me a nice little boy. But I have unfading memories of that peach. It was one of those exuberant peaches that meet you halfway, so to speak, and are all over in you in a moment. It was a beautiful, unspoiled product of a hothouse, and yet it managed quite successfully to give itself the airs of compote. You had to bite it and imbite it at the same time. To me, there has always been something charming and mystic in the thought of that delicate velvet globe of fruit slowly ripening and warming to perfection during the long summer days and perfumed nights, and then coming suddenly athwart my life in the supreme moment of its existence. I can never forget it, even if I'd wished to. And when I had devoured all that was edible of it, there still remained the stone, which a heedless, thoughtless child would doubtlessly have thrown away. But I put it down the neck of a young friend who was wearing a Descartes sailor suit. I told him it was a scorpion. And by the way he wriggled and screamed, he evidently believed it. Though, where the silly kid imagined I could have produced a live scorpion at a garden party, I do not know. Altogether, that peach is for me an unfading and happy memory. The defeated Tarrington had by this time reached out of ear's shot. <laughs> Comforting himself as best as he might with the reflection that a picnic which included the presence of Clovis might prove a doubtfully agreeable experience. I shall certainly go in for parliamentary career, said Clovis to himself as he turned complacently to rejoin his aunt. As a talker out of inconvenient bills, I should be invaluable. Hmm, the end. Kate Chopin and her short story called The Story of an Hour. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with heart trouble, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her, in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed in half-concealing. Her husband's friend Richard was there too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when intelligence of the railroad disaster was received. With Brentley Mallard's name leading at the top of lists of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second telegram and had hastened to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. She did not hear the story, as many women have heard the same, with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once, with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went up to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. There stood facing the open window, a comfortable roomy armchair. Into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. 
She could see in the open square before her the houses, the tops of trees that were all a-quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the streets below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. There were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless, except when a sob came up into her throat and shook her, as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. She was young, with a fair, calm face, whose line bespoke repression and even certain strength, but now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze was fixed away off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her, and she was waiting for it fearfully. What was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name, but she felt it creeping up of the sky. Running towards her through the sounds, the scents, the colors that filled the air, now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this feeling that was approaching to possess her. And she was striving to beat it back with her will, as powerless as her two white slender hands would have been. When she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over under her breath. Free, free, free. The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast, and the cursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She knew that she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked say with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely and she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for her. During those coming years, she would live for herself. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe that they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. And yet, she had loved him. Sometimes. Often she had not. What did it matter? What could love, that unsolved mystery, count for in the face of this possession of self-assertion which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being. Free, body and soul, free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door, I beg. Open the door. You will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Go away. I'm not making myself ill. No, she was drinking in the very elixir of life through that open window. 
Her fancy was running right along those days ahead of her. Spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday she had thought with a shudder that life might be long. She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard who entered. A little travel-stained, composedly carrying his gripsack and umbrella. He had been far away from the scene of accident, and did not even know that there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. But Richard was too late. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of joy that kills. The end of that tragic little tale. Kate Chopin called a respectable woman. Mrs. Baroda was a little provoked to learn that her husband expected his friend Gouvernay up to spend a week or two at the plantation. They had entertained a good deal during the winter. Much of the time had also been passed in New Orleans in various forms of mild dissipation. She was looking forward to a period of unbroken rest now, and undisturbed tete-a-tete -tete with her husband when he informed her that Gouvernet was coming up a week or two. This was a man she had heard much of but never seen. He had been her husband's college friend, was now a journalist, and in no sense a society man or a man about town, which were, perhaps, some of the reasons she had never met him. But she had unconsciously formed an image of him in her mind. She pictured him tall, slim, cynical, with eyeglasses and his hands in his pockets, and she did not like him. Gouvernet was slim enough, but he wasn't very tall nor very cynical, neither did he wear eyeglasses nor carry his hands in his pockets, and she rather liked him when he first presented himself. But why she liked him she could not explain satisfactorily to herself when she partly attempted to do so. She could discover in him none of those brilliant and promising traits which Gaston, her husband, had often assured her that he possessed, on the contrary, he sat rather mute and respective before her chatty eagerness to make him feel at home and in face of Gaston's frank and wordy hospitality. His manner was as courteous towards her as the most exacting woman could require, but he made no direct appeal to her approval or even esteem. Once settled at the plantation, he seemed to like to sit upon the wide portico in the shade of the big... Corinthian pillars, smoking his cigar lazily and listening attentively to Gaston's experience as a sugar planter. This is what I call living, he would utter, with deep satisfaction as the air that swept across the sugar fields caressed him with its warmth and scented velvety touch. It pleased him also to get on familiar terms with the big dogs that came about him, rubbing themselves sociably against his legs. He did not care to fish, and displayed no eagerness to go out and kill Grobex when Gaston proposed doing so. Gouvernet's personality puzzled Mrs. Baroda, but she did like him. Indeed, he was a lovable, inoffensive fellow. After a few days, when she could understand him no better than at first, she gave over being puzzled and remained piqued. In this mood she left her husband and her guest for the most part alone together. Then, finding that Gouvernet took no manner of exception to her action, she imposed her society upon him, 
accompanying him in his idle strolls to the mill and walks along the batcher. She presently sought to penetrate the reserve in which he had unconsciously enveloped himself. "'When is he going, your friend?' she one day asked her husband. "'For my part, he tires me frightfully.' "'Not for a week yet, dear. I can't understand. He gives you no trouble.' "'No. I should like him better if he did.' if he were more like others, and I had to plan somewhat for his comforts and enjoyments. Gaston took his wife's pretty face between his hands and looked tenderly and laughingly into her troubled eyes. They were making a bit of toilet sociably together in Mrs. Baroda's dressing room. You are full of surprises, my belle, he said to her. Even I can never count upon how you are going to act under given conditions. He kissed her and turned to fasten his cravat before the mirror. Here you are, he went on, taking poor Gouvernet seriously and making a commotion over him, the last thing he would desire or expect. Commotion? she hotly resented. Nonsense! How can you say such a thing? Commotion indeed! But you know, you said he was clever. And so he is. "'But the poor fellow is run down by overwork now. "'That's why I asked him here to take a rest.' "'You used to say he was a man of ideas,' she retorted unconciliated. "'I expected him to be interesting at least. "'I'm going to the city in the morning to have my spring gowns fitted. "'Let me know when Mr. Governor is gone. "'I shall be at my Aunt Octavie's. That night she went and sat alone upon a bench that stood beneath a live oak tree at the edge of the gravel walk. She had never known her thoughts or her intention to be so confused. She could gather nothing from them but the feeling of a distinct necessity to quit her home in the morning. Mrs. Baroda heard footsteps crunching the gravel but could discern in the darkness only the approaching red point of a lighted cigar. She knew it was Gouverneur, for her husband did not smoke. She hoped to remain unnoticed, but her white gown revealed her to him. He threw away his cigar and seated himself upon the bench beside her, without a suspicion that she might object to his presence. "'Your husband told me to bring this to you, Mrs. Baroda,' he said, handing her a filmy white scarf with which she sometimes enveloped her head and shoulders. She accepted the scarf from him with a murmur of thanks and let it lie in her lap. He made some commonplace observation upon the baneful effect of the night air at that season. Then, as his gaze reached out to the darkness, he murmured half to himself, Night of south winds, night of large few stars, still nodding night. She made no reply to this apostrophe to the night, which indeed was not addressed to her. Gouverneur was in no sense a defiant man, for he was not a self-conscious one. His periods of reserve were not constitutional, but the result of moods. Sitting there beside Mrs. Baroda, his silence melted for the time. He talked freely and intimately in a low, hesitating drawl that was not unpleasant to her. He talked of the old college days when he and Gaston had been a good deal to each other, of the days of keen and blind ambition and large intentions. Now there was left with him at least a philosophic acquaintance to the existing order, only a desire to be permitted to exist, with now and then a little whiff of genuine life such as he was breathing now. Her mind only vaguely grasped what he was saying. Her physical being was for the moment predominant. She was not thinking of his words, only drinking in the tones of his voice. She wanted to reach out her hand in the darkness and touch him with the sensitive tips of her fingers upon the face or the lips. She wanted to draw close to him and whisper against his cheek she did not care what, as she might have done if she had not been a respectable woman. The stronger the impulse grew to bring herself near him, 
the farther, in fact, did she pull away from him. As soon as she could do so without an appearance of too great rudeness, she rose and left him there alone. Before she reached the house, Gouvernet had lighted a fresh cigar and ended his apostrophe to the night. Mrs. Baroda was greatly tempted that night to tell her husband, who was also her friend, of this folly that had seized her, but she did not yield to the temptation. Besides being a respectable woman, she was a very sensible one, and she knew there are some battles in life which a human being must fight alone. When Gaston arose in the morning, his wife had already departed. She had taken an early morning train to the city. She did not return till Gouvernet was gone from under her roof. There was some talk of having him back during the summer that followed. That is, Gaston greatly desired it. But his desire yielded to his wife's strenuous opposition. However, before the year ended, she proposed wholly from herself to have Gouvernet visit them again. Her husband was surprised and delighted with the suggestion coming from her. I am glad, cher ami, to know that you have finally overcome your dislike for him. Truly, he did not deserve it. Oh, she told him laughingly, pressing a long, tender kiss upon his lips. I have overcome everything. You'll see. This time I shall be very nice to him. The end of that cute little story with Anton Chekhov and his short story called The Malefactor. A thin, a very thin little peasant stood before the examining magistrate. He wore a striped shirt and patched trousers. His shaggy beard, his pockmarked face, his eyes scarcely visible under their bushy, overhanging brows, gave him a harsh and forbidding expression, to which a mane of matted, unkept hair added a spider-like ferocity. He was barefoot. Denis Grigoriv, began the magistrate. Come nearer and answer my questions. While patrolling the track on the 17th of last July, Ivan Akinfuf, the railroad watchman, found you at the 141st verst unscrewing one of the nuts that fastened the rail to the ties. Here is the nut he had when he arrested you. Is this true? What, 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 what's that? Did everything happen as Akinfuf reports? Yes, just as he reports. Very well. Now, what was your object in unscrewing that nut? What's that? Stop your what's that and answer my question. Why did you unscrew the nut? If I hadn't needed the nut, I wouldn't have unscrewed it, grunted Dennis, glancing at the ceiling. And what did you need it for? What for? We make sinkers out of nuts. Whom do you mean by we? We the people. The peasants of Kilmov. Look here, man. No playing the idiot. Talk sense. And don't lie to me about sinkers. I've, I've, I've never lied in my life, muttered Dennis, blinking. How can one possibly fish without sinkers, your honor? If you baited your hook without a sinker or a roach, do you think it would sink to the bottom without a sinker? You tell me I'm lying, laughed Dennis. A fine bait a sinker would make, floating on the top of the water. Fasten spike. An eel always take ground bait. A floating bait would only be taken by a garfish, and they won't take it often. Anyway, we haven't any garfish in our river. They like the open. Why are you talking to me about garfish? What's that? Didn't you ask me about fishing? All the gentlemen with us fish like that. The smallest boy knows more than to fish without a sinker. 
Of course, there are some people who don't know anything, and they go fishing without sinkers. Fools obey no laws. So you tell me you unscrew this nut to use as a weight? What else would I have unscrewed it for? To play knuckle bones with? But you might have made a weight out of a piece of lead or a bullet or a nail or something. Lead does not grow in every bush. It has to be bought, and a nail wouldn't do. There is nothing so good to make a weight as a nut. It is heavy and has a hole in it. What a fool he's pretending to be. You act as if you were only one day old or had just dropped from the clouds. Don't you see, you donkey? What the consequences of this unscrewing must be. If the watchman hadn't found you, one of the trains might have run off the track and killed everybody, and you would have killed them. God forbid, Your Honor. Do you think we are wicked heathens? Praise be to God, kind master. Not only have we never killed anybody, we've never even thought of it. Holy Mother, preserve us and have mercy upon us. How can you say such things? Dennis smirked and winked incredulously at the magistrate. Huh, for how many years has the whole village been unscrewing nuts and not an accident yet? If we were to carry a rail away or even to put a log across the track, then perhaps the train might be upset. But Lord, a nut? Pooh. But can't you understand that the nuts fasten the rails to the ties? Yes, we understand that, and so we don't unscrew them all. We always leave some. We do it carefully. We understand. Dennis yawned and made the sign of cross over his mouth. A train ran off the track not far from here last year, said the magistrate. Now I know why. What did you say? Now I say I know why the train ran off the tracks last year. Yes, you have been educated to know these things. Kind master, you can understand just why everything is, but that watchman is a peasant who doesn't know anything. He just grabbed me by the coat collar and dragged me away. One ought to judge first and drag later. But a peasant has the sense of a peasant. You might write down, your honor, that he hit me twice once in the mouth and in the chest. Another nut was found when your house was searched. Where did you unscrew that one and when? Do you mean the nut that was lying under the little red chest? I haven't any idea where it was lying, but it was found. Where did you unscrew it? I didn't unscrew it. It was given to me by Ignashka, the son of one-eyed Simon, that is, I am speaking of the nut under the little chest, the one in the sigh under the courtyard. Mitrofan and I unscrewed together. Which Mitrofan? Mitrofan Petrov. Have you not heard of him? He is the man that makes fishing nets and sells them to the gentleman. He needs a lot of nuts in his business, a dozen to every net. Listen! In Article 1081 of the Code, it says that whoever intentionally commits an act of injury to a railroad, whereby an accident might result to the trains, and who knows that such an accident might result, do you hear that? Who knows? Shall be severely punished. You could not but have known that this unscrewing would lead to. The sentence is exile and hard labor. Of course. You know that better than I do. We people live in darkness. How can we know such things? You know it all perfectly well. You are lying and shaming ignorance. Why should I lie? Ask anybody in the village if you don't believe me. They never catch a thing but roach without a sinker. Even gudgeons hardly ever bite unless you use one. Now you're going on about that garfish again, smiled the magistrate. 
We don't have garfish in our river. If we let the bait float on the top without a sinker, we sometimes catch a perch, but not often. Oh, stop talking! Silence fell. Dennis stood first on one leg and then on the other and stared at the table, winking rapidly as if he saw the sun before his eyes and not a green tablecloth. The magistrate was writing quickly. I shall have to arrest you and send you to prison. Dennis stopped winking, raised his heavy eyebrows, and looked inquiringly at the magistrate. How do you mean to prison? I haven't got the time. I have to go to the fair to collect the three rubles that Gregory owes me for tallow. Stop talking! Don't interrupt! To prison? If there was any reason, of course I'd go, but living as I do, what is it for? I haven't robbed anyone. I haven't been fighting. If it is the payment of my rent you are thinking about, you mustn't believe what the bailiff says, your honor. Ask any one of the gentlemen. The bailiff is a thief, sir. Stop talking! I'll stop, mumbled Dennis. All the same. I'll swear under oath that that bailiff has muddled his books. There are three brothers in our family, Kuzma and Gregory and I. You are interrupting me. Here, Simon, called the magistrate. Take this man away. There are three brothers in our family, muttered Dennis as two strapping soldiers took hold of him and led him out of the room. I can't be responsible for my brother. Kuzma won't pay his debts, and I, Dennis, have to suffer. You call yourself judges. If our old master, the general, were alive, he would teach you judges your business. You ought to be reasonable and not condemn so wildly. Flog a man if he deserves it. The End Guide him up a slant. It's time to get a little emotional with his wonderfully written story simply called Happiness. Let's go. Oh, it is so beautiful. It was released in 1884. Happiness. It was tea time before the lamps were brought in. The villa lived down on the sea the sundown had left the sky all rosy and golden, and the Mediterranean, without a wrinkle on its surface, without a tremor, smooth and still shimmering as the day departed, seemed like a huge sheet of polished metal. In the distance, away to the right, the jagged peaks of the mountains stood out black against the faint purple of the western sky. They were talking about love, that old subject and they were saying things that had already been said very often. The gentle melancholy of the twilight brought a feeling of tenderness into the discussion, and this word love, which was constantly being uttered, now in a deep voice of a man, now in the higher tones of a woman, seemed to fill the little room, to flutter round it as a bird, to hover over it as a spirit. Can one go on loving for several years in succession? Yes, said some. No, asserted others. They recognized distinctions of degree, set down limits and brought forward examples, and all of them, men and women, filled with recollections which rose up within them and disturbed their souls, which came to their lips and which they could not quote spoke of that something commonplace and all-powerful and tender and mysterious agreement between two human beings with profound emotional and devouring interest. Suddenly, someone who was looking out over the sea shouted, Look down there! What is it? Away out to the sea could be seen just above the horizon a great gray mass rising, indistinct from the water. The women had got up and were looking. 
uncomprehendingly at that strange thing which they had never seen before. Somebody said, It's Corsica. It can be seen like this two or three times a year in certain exceptional atmospherical conditions, when the air is perfectly clear and it is no longer hidden by those sea mists which always veil the distance. They could just see the mountains and thought they could distinguish the snow on their tops. They all stood surprised, disturbed, almost frightened, by the sudden apparition of an unknown world, this phantom rising from the sea. Perhaps those who, like Columbus, set forth across unexplored oceans, had the same strange visions. Then an old gentleman, who had not yet spoken, said, I have known on this island, which is now rising before us as if itself to answer the question we have been discussing and to recall to me a curious memory, an admirable example of constant love, of love which was quite marvelously happy. Let me tell you about it. Five years ago, I took a trip to Corsica. The wilds of that island are less known to us and farther away from us than America, though we sometimes see it from the coast of France as we can just now. Picture to yourself a world still in a state of chaos, a confused mass of mountains divided by narrow ravines, through which torrents rush. There is not a plain, nothing but immense masses of granite and great stretches of rolling country covered with scrub and chestnut and pine forest. It is a virgin, uncultivated, barren country though from time to time one comes across a village perched like a heap of rocks on the top of a mountain. There is no culture, no industry, no art. One never comes across a single piece of carved wood or sculptured stone or anything to remind one of the feeling that if primitive or refined of the ancestors of these people for what is charming and beautiful what indeed impresses one most in that magnificent but raw country is the age-long indifference of the people to that seeking for charm and expression which we know as art. Italy, or every place full of masterpieces, is itself a masterpiece, where marble, wood, bronze, iron, metals, and stone all bear witness to men's genius where the smallest objects scattered about in old houses reveal the heaven-born instinct for charm. Italy is for us the divine country, which we love because there we see the greatness, the power, the unwearying striving, and the triumph of the creative intelligence of man. And opposite it, Corsica has remained as barbaric as it was in the beginning. There man lives in his rude house, indifferent to everything that does not concern himself or his family feuds. And there he has existed through all the years with all the defects and all the good points of half-civilized races, easily moved to anger, malicious, thoughtlessly cruel, yet hospitable generous, loyal, simple-minded, opening his door to the passer-by and giving his faithful friendship in exchange for the smallest mark of sympathy. For a month I wandered through this magnificent island with the feeling that I was at the end of the world. No inns, no taverns, no roads. You reach by mule paths those little villages which seem to be hooked on to the sides of the mountains and which look down on winding abysses, from which you hear at night the everlasting melancholy, long drawing out roar of the mountain torrent. You knock at a door and ask for shelter and food till next morning. You sit down at their poor table and you sleep under their poor roof, and in the morning you shake the hand of your host as he leaves you at the end of the village. Well, one evening, after a ten hours' tramp, I reached a little lonely house at the bottom of a narrow valley which opened 
out to the sea a league further on. The two steep slopes of the mountain, covered with brushwood, loose rocks and big trees, shut in this inexplicably melancholy valley as with two dark walls. Round the cottage were to be seen a few vines, a small garden, and, at a little distance, some big chestnut trees, something to live on anyhow, and a fortune in this poor land. The woman who opened the door was old, stern, and exceptionally clean. The man, sitting in a rush chair, rose to greet me and then sat down again without saying a word. His companion said, Excuse him. He is deaf now. He is eighty-two. She spoke perfect French to my surprise. I asked, Are you not Corsicans? She replied, No. We came from the mainland, but we have been here for fifty years. I had a feeling of sorrow and of fear as I thought of those fifty years spent in this dark hole, so remote from man and his towns. An old shepherd came in, and we began to eat that one dish which was our dinner, a thick soup of potatoes, bacon, and cabbage. When the little meal was over, I went and sat outside, my heart full of the melancholy of the desolate countryside, with the feeling of distress which travelers sometimes experience when the evening is gloomy and the place is desolate. On those occasions, it seems that all is nearly at an end. One's own existence and the world itself one sees with a flash the awful misery of life, the loneliness of mankind, the emptiness and the dark solitude of hearts which lull and deceive themselves with dreams to the very end. The old woman came up to me and worried by the curiosity which ever existed in even the most resigned heart, she asked, Are you from France? Yes, I am having holiday here. You come from Paris, perhaps? No, from Nancy. It seemed to me that an extraordinary agitation shook her. How I saw, or rather felt it, I do not know. She repeated slowly. You come from Nancy? The man appeared in the doorway, impassive as the deaf always are. She continued. It doesn't matter. He can't hear. Then, after a few seconds, You know a good many people in Nancy, then? Certainly, nearly everybody. The Saint Alice family? Yes, very well. They were friends of my father's. What is your name? I told her. She looked at me steadily. Then in the low voice of one who is calling back the unforgettable past, she went on. Yes, of course. I remember quite well. And the Bersemers? What has become of them? They are all dead. Dear, dear. And the Sermons? Do you know them? Yes. The last of them is a general. Then, shaking with distress, with some indefinable feeling, at once powerful and scared, with some desire to lay bare her heart, to tell everything, to speak of those things which, up till then, she had kept securely within her, and of those people whose names so moved her, she said, Yes, Henry de Sermont, I know him well. He is my brother. I looked up at her, thunderstruck, then, all of a sudden, a bygone memory came back to me. There had been a great scandal in high circles in Lorraine. Suzanne de Sermont, a rich and beautiful girl, had been carried off by a non-commissioned officer of a regiment of hussars, which her father commanded. He was a good-looking boy of peasant parentage, but handsome in his blue tunic, the soldier who had run away with the colonel's daughter. No doubt she had seen him, noted him, and loved him as she watched the squadrons go by. But how she had been able to speak to him, 
how they had been able to meet to understand each other, how she had been bold enough to make him see that she loved him, that was never known. What followed was neither guessed nor anticipated. One evening, just when his term of service was finished, he disappeared with her. They were hunted but not found. No news of them were ever to be had, and she was looked upon as dead. And now I found her in this gloomy valley. Then I said in my turn, I remember quite well. You are Mademoiselle Suzanne. She nodded, and tears fell from her eyes. Then, looking towards the old man standing motionless on the threshold of his cottage, she said, That is he. I knew then that she was still loving him, and that she still saw the enticing light of bygone days in his eyes. I asked, Have you at least been happy? She answered in a voice that came straight from her heart. Oh, yes. Very happy. He made me very happy. I have never had a single regret. I looked at her, sorrowful, surprised, wonderstruck by the power of love. This rich girl had followed this man, this peasant. Herself had become a peasant. She had fashioned for herself a life like this, devoid of grace, of luxury, of any kind of daintiness, and she had trained herself to become accustomed to his simple habits, and she still loved him. With her peasant's bonnet and cloth petticoat, she had become a peasant herself. Seated on a rush bottom chair at a plain wooden table, she ate out of an earthenware dish, a stew made of cabbages and potatoes and bacon. She slept on a straw mattress at his side. She had never thought of anything but him. She had never regretted her jewels, her fine clothes, the softness of chairs, the scent of warm rooms with their tapestries, or the delicious comfort of a feathered bed. She had never needed anything but him. As long as he was there, she desired nothing else. Quite young, she had given up life, society, and those who had brought her up and loved her. She had come alone with him to this wild valley. He had been everything to her, everything that one desires, everything that one dreams of, everything that one is always waiting for, always hoping for. From beginning to end, he had filled her life with happiness, and she could not have been happier. All night, as I listened to the hoarse breathing of the old soldier on his pallet bedside, her who had followed him so far, I thought of this strange and simple adventure, of this happiness, which was so complete, yet made up of so little. At daybreak, I left the house after shaking the hands of the old couple. The storyteller finished. One of the women said, All the same, that woman had too simple an ideal. With her two primitive needs and her little wants, she must have been a fool. Another said quietly, What does it matter? She was happy. Away on the horizon, Corsica buried itself in the darkness, disappearing slowly in the sea, from which it had risen as if itself to tell the story of the two humble lovers whom its shores had sheltered. The End Another short story by Anton Chekhov. This one is called Over Seasoned, and it was first released in 1885. On arriving at Deadwell Station, Gleb Smirnov, the surveyor, found that the farm to which his business called him still lay some thirty or forty miles further on. If the driver would be sober and the horses could stand up, the distance would be less than thirty miles. With a fuddled driver and an old skates for horse, it might amount to fifty. 
Will you tell me, please, where I can get some post horses? Asked the surveyor to the station master. What? Post horses? You won't even find a stray dog within a hundred miles of here, let alone post horses. Where do you want to go? To Devoncote, General Hohoto's farm. Well, yawned the station master. Go round behind the station. There are some peasants there that sometimes take passengers. The surveyor sighed and betook himself wearily to the back of the station. There, after a long search and much disputing and agitating, he at least secured a huge lusty peasant, surely pockmarked, wearing a ragged coat of gray cloth and straw shoes. What a devil of a wagon you have, grumbled the surveyor, climbing in. I can't tell which is the front and which is the back. Can't you? The horse's tail is in the front, and where your honor sits is the back. The pony was young but gaunt with sprawling legs and ragged ears. When the driver stood up and beat it with its rope whip, it only shook its head. When he raided it suddenly and beat it a second time, the wagon groaned and shuddered as if in fever. At the third stroke, the wagon rocked, and at the fourth, moved slowly away. Will it be like this all the way? asked the surveyor, violently shaken and wondering of the ability of Russian drivers for combining the gentle crawl of a tortoise with the most soul-tracking bumping. We'll get there, the driver soothed him. The little mare is young and spry. Only let her get started and there is no stopping her. Get up, you devil. They left the station at dusk. To the right stretched a cold, dark plain so boundless and vast that if you crossed it, no doubt you would come to the end of nowhere. The old autumn sunset burned out slowly where the edge of it melted into the sky. To the left, in the fading light, some little mounds rose up that might have been either trees or last year's haystacks. The surveyor could not see what lay ahead, but here the whole landscape was blotted out by the broad, clumsy back of the driver. The air was still, but frosty and cold. What desolation, thought the surveyor, trying to cover his ears with his coat collar. Not a hut nor house. If we were beset and robbed here, not a soul would know it. Not even if we were to fire cannons. And that driver isn't trustworthy. What a devil of a back he has. It is as much as a man's life is worth even to touch a child of nature like that with his forefinger. He has an ill-looking snout like a wild animal. Look here, friend, asked the surveyor. What's your name? My name? Clem. Well, Clem, how is it about here? Not dangerous. No one plays any tricks. How oh, Lord preserve us no, who would there to be to play pranks? That's right, but in any case, I have three revolvers here, the surveyor lied, and you know it's a bad plan to joke with a revolver. One revolver is a match for ten robbers. Night fell. Suddenly the wagon cracked, groaned, trembled, and turned to the left as if against its will. Where is he taking me now? thought the surveyor. He was going straight ahead, and now he has suddenly turned to the left. I am afraid the scoundrel is carrying me off to some lonely thicket, and, and, things have been known to happen. Listen, he said to the driver. So you say there is no danger here? Well, that's a pity. I love a good fight with robbers. I am small and sickly to look at, but I have the strength of an ox. 
Three robbers attacked me once, and what do you think? I shook one of them so that, well, it killed him. The other two I sent to hard labor in Siberia. I can't think where all my strength comes from. I could take a big rascal like you in one hand and, and skin him. Klim looked around at the surveyor, blinked all over his face, and dealt his pony a blow. Yes, my friend, continued the surveyor, heaven help the robber if it falls into my hands. Not only would he be left without arms or legs, but he would have to answer for his crimes in court, where all the judges and lawyers are friends of mine. I am a government official and a very important one. When I am traveling like this, the government knows it and keeps an eye on me to see that no one does me any harm. There are policemen and police captains hitting in the bushes all along the road. Stop, stop, yelled the surveyor suddenly. Where are you going? Where are you taking me to? Can't you see? Into the wood. So he is, thought the surveyor. I was frightened. I mustn't show my feelings. He has already seen that I am afraid of him. What makes him look around at me so often? He must be meditating something. At first we barely moved, and now we are flying. Listen, Clem, why do you hurry your horse so? I'm not hurrying her. She is running away of her own accord. When once she begins running away, nothing will stop her. She is sorry herself that her legs are made that way. That's a lie, my friend. I can see it's a lie. I advise you not to go so fast. Hold your horse in, do you hear? Hold him in. Why? Because, because I have friends following me from the station. I want them to catch up. They promise to catch me up in this wood. It will be jollier traveling with them. They are big, strong fellows. Every one of them has a revolver. Why do you look round and jump about as if you were sitting on a tack? Hey, see here. I, I, there is nothing about me worth looking at. There is nothing interesting about me in the least, unless it is my revolvers. Here. If you want to see them, I'll take them out and show them to you. Let me get them. The surveyor pretended to be searching in his pockets, and at that moment something happened which not even his worst fears had led him to expect. Clem suddenly threw himself out of the wagon and ran off on all fours through the forest. Help! he shouted. Take my horse, take my wagon, accursed one. Only spare me my soul. Help. The sound of his hurrying footsteps died away. The dry leaves rustled and all was still. When this unexpected judgment fell on him, the surveyor's first act was to stop the horse. Then he settled himself more comfortably into the wagon and began to think. So he has taken fright and made off? The fool! Well, what shall I do now? I don't know the way, so I can't go alone. And anyway, if I did, it would look as if I had stolen his horse. What shall I do? Clam! 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 answered the echo. At the idea of spending the whole night alone in a dark forest, listening to the wolves, the echo, the snorting of the lean pony, the surveyor felt the goose flesh running up and down his spine. Clem, he yelled. Dear old Clem, good Clem, where are you? For two hours he called and it was not until he had lost his voice and resigned himself to the thought of a night in the forest that a faint breeze brought him the sound of a groan. 
Clem, is that you, old man? Come, Clem, let us start. You, you'll kill me. What, Clem? I was only joking, old chap. Upon my word, I was. Fancy my carrying revolvers with me. I lied like that because I was afraid. Do let us start. I'm frozen. Clem, thinking no doubt that a real robber would have made off long ago with a horse and wagon, came out of the forest and approached his fare with cautions. What are you afraid of, idiot? I was only joking. And you are afraid of me? Get in. Lord, mister, muttered Clem, climbing into the wagon. If I had foreseen this, I wouldn't have taken you on for a hundred rubbles. You have nearly scared me to death. Clem beat his pony. The wagon shuddered. Clem beat him again. The wagon rocked. At the fourth stroke, the wagon moved slowly away. The surveyor pulled his coat collar over his ears and abandoned himself to meditation. Neither Clem or the road seem dangerous now. The end. Today we're doing our first O. Henry story. It is called Roads of Destiny. I go to seek on many roads what is to be. True heart and strong with love so light. Will they not bear me in the fight? To order, shun, or wield, or mold my destiny. Unpublished poem by David Minot. The song was over. The words were David's. The air, one of the countryside. The company about the inn table applauded heartedly, for the young poet had paid for the wine. Only the notary. M. Papineau shook his head a little at the lines, for he was a man of books and had not drunk with the rest. David went out into the village street where the night air drove the wine vapor from his head, and then he remembered that he and Yvonne had quarreled that day, and that he had resolved to leave his home that night to seek fame and honor in the great world outside. When my poems are in every man's tongue, he told himself, it's a fine acceleration. She will, perhaps, think of the hard words she spoke this day. Except the roisters in the tavern, the village folk were abed. David crept softly into his room in the shed of his father's cottage and made a bundle of his small store of clothing. With this upon a staff, he set his face outwards upon the road that ran from Vernoy. He passed his father's herd of sheep huddled in their nightly pen, the sheep he herded daily, leaving them to scatter while he wrote verses on scraps of paper. He saw a light yet shining in Yvonne's window, and a weakness shook his purpose of a sudden. Perhaps that light meant that she rude, sleepless, her anger, and that morning might. But no, his decision was made. Vernoy was no place for him. Not one soul there could share his thoughts. Out along that road lay his fate and his future. Three leagues across the dim, moonlit champagne ran the road. Straight as a plowman's furrow, it was believed in the village that the road ran to Paris, at least, and this name the poet whispered often to himself as he walked. Never so far from Renoy had David traveled before. The Left Branch Three leagues then the road ran and turned into a puzzle. It joined with another and a larger road at the right angles. David stood uncertain for a while and then took the road to the left. Upon
upon this more important highway were, imprinted in the dust, wheel tracks left by the recent passage of some vehicle. Some half an hour later, these tracks were verified by the sight of a ponderous carriage merged in a little brook at the bottom of the steep hill. The driver and postulation was shouting and tugging at the horse's bridles. On the road on one side stood a huge black clothed man and a slender lady wrapped in a long light cloak. David saw the lack of skill in the efforts of the servants. He quietly assumed control over the work. He directed the outsiders to seize their clamor at the horses and to exercise their strength upon the wheels. The driver alone urged the animals with his familiar voice. David himself heaved a powerful shoulder at the rear of the carriage, and with one harmonious tug the great vehicle rolled up on solid ground and the outsiders climbed into their places. David stood for a moment upon one foot. The huge gentleman waved a hand. You will enter the carriage, he said in a voice large like himself, but smooth by art and habit. Obedience belonged in the path of such a voice. Brief as was the young poet's hesitation, it was cut shorter still by a renewal of the command. David's foot went on to the step. In the darkness, he perceived dimly the form of the lady upon the rear seat. He was about to sit himself opposite, when the voice again swayed him to its will. You will sit at the lady's side. The gentleman swung his great weight to the forward seat. The carriage proceeded up the hill. The lady was shrunk, silent, into her corner. David could not estimate whether she was old or young, but a delicate, mild perfume from her clothes stirred his poet's fancy to the belief that there was a loveliness beneath the mystery. Here was an adventure such as he had often imagined. But as yet, he held no key to it, for no words were spoken while he sat with his impenetrable companions. In an hour's time, David perceived through the window that the vehicle traversed the street of some town, then it stopped in the front of a closed and darkened house, and a postillion aligned to hammer impatiently upon the door. A latticed window above flew wide open and a nightcapped head popped out. Who are ye that disturbs honest folk at this time of night? My house is closed. Tis too late for profitable travelers to be abroad. Seize your knocking at my door and be off. Open for Monsieur the Marquis de Pupertus. Ah, cried the voice above. Ten thousand pardons, my lord. I did not know. The hour is so late. At once shall the door be opened and the house placed at my lord's disposal. Inside was heard the clank of chain and bar, and the door was flung open. Shivering with chill and apparition, the landlord of the silver flagon stood, half-clad, candle in hand, upon the threshold. David followed the Marquis out of the carriage. Assist the lady. He was ordered. The poet obeyed. He felt her small hand tremble as he guided her descent. Into the house was the next command. The room was the long dining hall of the tavern. A great oak table ran down its length. The huge gentleman seated himself in a chair at the near end. The lady sank into another against the wall with an air of great weariness. David stood considering how best he might now take his leave and continue upon his way. My lord, said the landlord, bowing to the floor, had I expected this honor, entertainment would have been ready. The, the, there is wine and cold fowl and m maybe... Candles, said the Marquis, spreading the fingers of one plump white hand in the gesture he had. Y y yes, my lord. He fetched half a dozen candles, lit them, and set them upon the table. If monsieur would perhaps dine to taste... A certain burgundy. 
There is a cask. Candles, said Monsieur, spreading his fingers. Assuredly, quickly, I fly, my lord. A dozen more lit candles shone in the hall. The great bulk of the Marquis overflowed his chair. He was dressed in fine black from head to foot, save for the snowy ruffles at his wrist and throat. Even the hilt and scabbard of his sword were black. His expression was one of sneering pride. The ends of an upturned moustache reached nearly to his mocking eyes. The lady sat motionless, and now David perceived that she was young and possessed a pathetic and appealing beauty. He was startled from the contemplation of her forlorn loveliness by the booming voice of the Marquis. What is your name and pursuit? David me not. I am a poet. The moustache of the Marquise curled nearer to his eyes. How do you live? I am also a shepherd. I guard my father's flock, David answered with his head high, but a flush upon his cheek. Then listen, Master Shepherd and Poet, to the fortune you have blundered upon tonight. This lady is my niece. Mademoiselle Louise de Vars. She is of noble descent and is possessed of ten thousand francs a year in her own right. As to her charms, you have but to observe yourself. If the inventory pleases your shepherd's heart, she becomes your wife at a word. Do not interrupt me. Tonight I convey her to the Chateau of Comte de Villemur to whom her hand had been promised. Guests were present, the priest was waiting. Her marriage to one eligible in rank and fortune was ready to be accomplished. At the altar, this demoiselle, so meek and dutiful, turned upon me like a leopardess, charged me with cruelty and crimes, and broke before the gasping priest the truth I had pledged for her. I swore there and then by Ten thousand devils, that she should marry the first man we met after leaving the chateau, be he prince, charcoal burner, or thief. You, shepherd, are the first. Mademoiselle must be wed this night, if not you, then another. You have ten minutes in which to make your decision. Do not vex me with words or questions. Ten minutes, shepherd and they are speeding. The Marquis drummed loudly with his white fingers upon the table. He sank into a veiled attitude of waiting. It was as if some great house had shut its doors and windows against approach. David would have spoken, but the huge man's bearing stopped his tongue. Instead, he stood by the lady's chair and bowed. Mademoiselle, he said, and he marveled to find his words flowing easily before so much elegance and beauty. You have heard me say I was a shepherd. I have also had the fancy at times that I am a poet. If it be the test of a poet to adore and cherish the beautiful, that fancy is now strengthened. Can I serve you in any way, mademoiselle? The young woman looked up at him with eyes dry and mournful. His frank, glowing face, made serious by the gravity of the adventure, his strong, straight figure, and the liquid sympathy in his big blue eyes, perhaps also her imminent need of long-denied help and kindness, thawed her to sudden tears. Monsieur, she said in low tones, you look to be true and kind. He is my uncle the brother of my father, and my only relative. He loved my mother, and he hates me because I'm like her. He has made my life one long terror. I am afraid of his very looks, and never before dared to disobey him. But tonight he would have married me to a man three times my age. You will forgive me for bringing this vexation upon you, monsieur. You will, of course, decline this mad act he tries to force upon you. 
but let me thank you for your generous words at least. I've had none spoken to me in so long. There was now something more than generosity in the poet's eye. Poet he must have been, for Yvonne was forgotten. This fine new loveliness held him with its freshness and grace. The subtle perfume from her filled him with strange emotions. His tender look fell warmly upon her. She leaned to it thirstily. Ten minutes, said David, is given me in which to do what I would devote years to achieve. I will not say I pity you, mademoiselle. It would not be true. I love you, and I cannot expect love from you yet. But let me rescue you from this cruel man, and in time, love may come. I think I have a future. I will not always be a shepherd. For the present, I will cherish you with all my heart and make your life less sad. Will you trust your faith to me, mademoiselle? You will regret it and despise me. I will live only to make you happy and myself worthy of you. Her fine small hand crept into his from beneath her cloak. I will trust you she breathed, with my life, and love may not be as far off as you think. Tell him, once away from the power of his eyes, I may forget. David went and stood before the Marquis. The black figure stirred, and the mocking eyes glanced at the great hall clock. Two minutes to spare? A shepherd requires eight minutes to decide whether he will accept a bride of beauty and income. Speak up, shepherd. Do you consent to become Mademoiselle's husband? Mademoiselle, said David, standing proudly, has done me the honor to yield to my request that she become my wife. Well said, said the Marquise. You have yet the making of a courtier in you, Master Shepherd. Mademoiselle could have drawn a worse price, after all. And now, to be done with the affair as quick as the church and the devil will allow. He struck the table soundly with his sword hilt. And landlord came, knee shaking, bringing more candles in the hope of anticipating the great lord's whims. Fetch a priest said the Marquis. A priest, do you understand? In ten minutes have a priest here, or... The landlord dropped his candles and flew. The priest came, heavy-eyed and ruffled. He made David Mignot and Louise de Verne's man and wife, pocketed a gold piece that the Marquis tossed him, and shuffled out again into the night. Wine, ordered the Marquis spreading his ominous fingers at the host. Fill glasses, he said, when it was brought. He stood up at the head of the table in the candlelight, a black mountain of venom and conceit with something like the memory of an old love turned to poison in his eyes as it fell upon his knees. Monsieur Minot, he said, raising his wine glass, drink after I say this to you. You have taken to be your wife, one who will make your life a foul and wretched thing. The blood in her is an inheritance, running black lies and red ruin. She will bring you shame and anxiety. The devil that descended to her is there in her eyes and skin and mouth that stoop even the beguiled peasant. There is your promise, Monsieur Poet, for a happy life. Drink your wine. At last, mademoiselle, I am rid of you. The Marquis drank. A little grievous cry, as if from a sudden wound, came from the girl's lips. David, with his glass in his hand, stepped forward three paces and faced the Marquis. There was little of shepherd in his bearing. Just now, he said calmly, you did me the honor to call me monsieur. May I hope, therefore, that my marriage 
to Mademoiselle has placed me somewhat nearer to you in, let's say, reflected rank, has given me the right to stand more as an equal to Monsieur in a certain little piece of business I have in my mind. You may hope, Shepherd, sneered the Marquis. Then, said David, dashing his glass of wine into the contemptuous eyes that mocked him, perhaps you will condescend to fight me. The fury of the great lord outbroke in sudden curse like a blast from a horn. He tore his sword from his black sheath. He called to the howling landlord, A sword here for this lout. He turned to the lady with a laugh that chilled her heart and said, You put much labor on me, madame. It seems I must find you a husband and make you a widow in the same night. I know not sword play, said David. He flushed to make the confession before his lady. I know not sword play, mimicked the Marquis. Shall we fight like peasants with oaken chuggles? Hola, Francois, my pistols. A postillion brought two shining gray pistols ornamented with carbon silver from the carriage holsters. The Marquis tossed one upon the table near David's hand. To the other end of the table, he cried. Even a shepherd may pull a trigger. Few of them attain the honor to die by the weapon of a debuberty. The shepherd and the Marquis faced each other from the ends of the long table. The landlord, in an ague of terror, clutched the air and stammered, m monsieur for the love of Christ, not in my house. Do not spill blood, it will ruin my custom. The look of the Marquis threatening him paralyzed his tongue. Coward, cried the Lord of Boberty. Cease chattering your teeth long enough to give the word for us if you can. My host's knees smoothed the floor. He was without a vocabulary. Even sounds were beyond him. Still, by gestures, he seemed to besiege peace in the name of his house and custom. I will give the word, said the lady in a clear voice. She went up to David and kissed him sweetly. Her eyes were sparkling bright, and color had come back to her cheek. She stood against the wall, and the two men leveled their pistols for her count. Un, deux, trois. The two reports came so nearly together that the candles flickered but once. The Marquis stood smiling, the fingers of his left hand resting, outspread upon the end of the table. David remained erect and turned his head very slowly, searching for his wife with his eyes. Then, as a garment falls from where it is hung, he sank, crumpled upon the floor. With a little cry of terror and despair, the widowed maid ran and stooped above him. She found his wound and then looked up with her old look of pale melancholy. Through his heart, she whispered. Oh, his heart. Come, boomed the great voice of the Marquis. Out with you to the carriage. Daybreak shall not find you on my hands. Wed you shall be again, and to a living husband this night. The next we come upon, my lady. Highwayman or peasant, if the road yields no other than the curl that opens my gate, out with you to the carriage. The Marquis, implacable and huge, the lady wrapped again in the mystery of her cloak, the postillion bearing the weapons, all moved out to the waiting carriage. The sound of its ponderous wheels rolling away echoed through the slumbering village. And the hall of the silver flagon, the distracted landlord wrung his hands above the slain poet's body, while the flames of the four and twenty candles danced and flickered on the table. The Right Branch Three leagues, then, the road ran and turned into a puzzle. 
It joined with another and larger road at the right angles. David stood uncertain for a while and then took the road to the right. Whither it led, he knew not. He was resolved to leave Vernoy far behind that night. He traveled a league and then passed the large chateau, which showed testimony of recent entertainment. Lights shone from every window. From the great stone gateway ran a tracery of wheel tracks drawn in the dust by the vehicles of the guests. Three leagues further, and David was weary. He rested and slept for a while on a bed of pine boughs at the roadside, then up and on again along the unknown way. Thus for five days he traveled the great road, sleeping upon nature's balsamic beds and a peasant's ricks, eating off their black hospitable bread, drinking from streams or the willing cup of the goat herd. At length he crossed a great bridge and set his foot within the smiling city that had crushed and crowned more poets than all the rest of the world. His breath came quickly as Paris sang to him in a little undertone her vital chant of greeting, the hum of voice and foot and wheels. High up under the eaves of an old house in the Rue Conti, David paid for lodging and set himself in a wooden chair to his poems. The street, once sheltering citizens of import and consequence, was now given over to those who ever follow in the wake of decline. The houses were tall and still possessed of a ruined dignity, but many of them were empty save for dust on the spider. By night there was a clash of steel and the cries of brawlers straying restlessly from inn to inn, where once gently abode was now but a rancid and rude incontinence. But here David found housing commensurate to his scant purse. Daylight and candlelight found him at pen and paper. One afternoon he was returning from a foraging trip to the lower world with bread and curds and bottle of thin wine Halfway up his dark stairway he met, or rather came upon, for she rested on the stairs, a young woman of a beauty that could balk even the justice of a poet's imagination. A loose dark cloak flung open showed a rich gown beneath. Her eyes changed swiftly with every shade of thought. With one moment, they would be round and artless like a child, and long and cozening like a gypsy's. One hand raised her gown, undraping a little shoe, high-heeled with its ribbons dangling untied. So heavenly she was, so unfitted to stoop, so qualified to charm and command. Perhaps she had seen David coming and had waited for his help there. Ah, oh, would Monsieur pardon that she occupied the stairway, but the shoe, the naughty shoe, at last it would not remain tied. Ah, oh, if Monsieur would be so gracious. The poet's fingers trembled as he tied the contrary ribbons. Then he would have fled from the danger of her presence, but the eyes grew long and causing like a gypsy's, and held him. He leaned against the balustrade, clutching his bottle of sour wine. You have been so good, she said, smiling. Does Monsieur perhaps live in the house? Yes, madame. I, I, I think so, madame. Perhaps in the third story, then? No, madame. Higher up. The lady fluttered her fingers with the least possible gesture of impatience. Pardon. Certainly I am not discreet in asking. Monsieur will forgive me. It is surely not becoming that I should inquire where he lodges. Madame, do not say so. I live in the... No, no, no. Do not tell me. Now I see that I have erred. 
but I cannot lose the interest I feel in this house and all that is in it. Once it was my home. Often I come here about to dream of those happy days again. Will you let that be my excuse? Let me tell you then, for you need no excuse. Stammer the poet. I live in the top floor, the small room where the stairs turn. In the front room? Asked the lady, turning her head sideways. The rear, madame. The lady sighed as if with relief. I will detain you no longer then, monsieur, she said, employing the round and artless eye. Take good care of my house, at last. Only the memories of it are mine now. Adieu, and accept my thanks for your courtesy. She was gone, leaving but a smile and a trace of sweet perfume. David climbed the stairs as one in slumber, but he awoke from it and the smile and the perfume lingered with him, and never afterward did either seem quite to leave him. This lady of whom he knew nothing drove him to lyrics of eyes, chasms, of swiftly conceived love, odes to curling hair, and sonnets to slippers of slender feet. Poet he must have been, for Yvonne was forgotten. This fine new loveliness held him with its freshness and grace. The subtle perfume about her filled him with strange emotions. On a certain night, three persons were gathered about the table in the room on the third floor of the same house. Three chairs and a table and a lit candle upon it was all the furniture. One of the persons was a huge man dressed in black. His expression was one of sneering pride. The ends of his upturned moustache reached nearly to his mocking eyes. Another was a lady, the young and beautiful, with eyes that could be round and artless like a child, or long and causing like gypsies, but were now keen and ambitious, like any other conspirators. The third man was a man of action, a combatant, a bold and impatient executive, breathing fire and steel. He was addressed by the others as Captain Deswold. This man struck the table with his fist and said with a controlled violence, Tonight, tonight, as he goes to midnight mass, I am tired of the plotting that gets nowhere. I am sick of signals and chippers in secret meetings and such bargaining. Let us be honest, traitors. If France is to be rid of him, let us kill him in the open, and not hunt with snares and traps. Tonight, I say, and back my word, my hand will do the deed, tonight, as he goes to Mass. The lady turned upon him with a cordial look. Women, however wedded to plots, must ever thus bow to rash courage. The big man stroked his upturned moustache. Dear Captain, he said in a great voice, softened by habits, this time I agree with you. Nothing is to be gained by waiting. Enough of the palace guards belongs to us to make the endeavor a safe one. Tonight, repeated Captain Desrolles, again striking the table. You have heard me, Marquis. My hand will do the deed. But now said the huge man softly, comes a question. Word must be sent to our partitions in the palace, and a signal agreed upon. Our staunchest men must accompany the royal carriage. At this hour, what messenger can penetrate so far as the south doorway? Rebel is stationed there. Once the message is placed in his hands, all will go well. I will send the message, said the lady. You, Countess, said the Marquise, raising his eyebrow. Your devotion is great, we know, but... Listen, exclaimed the lady, rising and resting her hands upon the table. In a garret of this house lives a youth from the provinces, as guileless and tender as the lambs he tended there. 
I have met him twice or thrice upon the stairs, and questioned him, fearing that he might dwell too near the room in which we are accustomed to meet. He is mine if I will. He writes poems in his garret, and I think he dreams of me. He will do what I say. He shall take the message to the palace. The Marquis rose from his chair and bowed. You did not permit me to finish my sentence, Countess, he said. I would have said, your devotion is great, but your wit and charm are infinitely greater. While the conspirators were thus engaged, David was polishing some lines addressed to his amorette d'Esclair. He heard a timorous knock at the door and opened it with a great throb to behold her there, panting as one in straits, with eyes wide open and artless like a child. Monsieur, she breathed, I've come to you in distress. I believe you to be good and true, and I know of no other help. How I flew through the streets amongst the swaggering men. Monsieur, my mother is dying. My uncle is a captain of guards in the palace of the king. Someone must fly to bring him. May I hope? Mademoiselle, interrupted David, his eyes shining with a desire to do her service. Your hopes shall be my wings. Tell me, how may I reach him? The lady thrust a sealed paper into his hand. Go to the south gate. A south gate, mind, and say to the guards there, The falcon has left his nest. They will pass you, and you will go to the south entrance to the palace. Repeat the words, and give the letter to the man who will reply. Let him strike when he will. This is the password, monsieur, entrusted to me by my uncle. For now, when the country is disturbed and men plot against the king's life, no one without it can gain insurance to the palace ground after nightfall. If you will, monsieur, take him this letter so that my mother may see him before she closes her eye. Give it me, said David eagerly. But shall I let you return home through the streets alone so late? I... No, no, fly! Each moment is like a precious jewel. Some time, said the lady with eyes long causing like a gypsy's. I will try to thank you for your goodness. The poet thrust the letter into his breast and bounded down the stairways. The lady, when he was gone, returned to the room below. The eloquent eyebrows of the Marquis interrogated her. He is gone, she said as fleet and stupid as one of his own sheep, to deliver it. The table shook again from the batter of Captain de Rolle's fist. Sacred name, he cried. I have left my pistols behind. I can trust no others. Take this, said the Marquis, drawing from beneath his cloak a shining great weapon ornamented with carven silver. There are none truer but guard it closely, for it bears my arm and chest, and already I'm suspected. Me, I must put many leagues between myself and Poe tonight. Tomorrow must find me in my chateau. After you, dear Countess. The Marquis puffed out the candle, the lady well cloaked, and two gentlemen softly descended the stairway and followed into the crowd that roamed along the narrow pavements of the Rue Conti. David sped. At the south gate of the king's residence, a halberd was laid to his breast, but he returned his point with the words, The falcon has left his nest. Pass, brother, said the guard, and go quickly. On the south step of the palace, they moved to seize him, but again the moat of the pass charmed the watchers. One among them stepped forward and began, Let him strike but a flurry among the guards told of a surprise. A man of keen look and soldiery stride suddenly pressed through them and seized the letter which David held in his hand. Come with me, he said, and led him inside the great hall. Then he tore open the letter and read it. 
he beckoned to a man uniformed as an officer of musketeers who was passing. Captain Tatro, you will have the guards at the south entrance and the south gate arrested and confined. Place men known to be loyal in their places. To David he said, Come with me. He conducted him through a corridor and an ante room into a spacious chamber where a melancholy man, somberly dressed, sat brooding in a great leather covered chair. To that man he said, Sire, I have told you that the palace is full of traitors and spies as a sewer is of rats. You have thought, Sire, that it was my fancy. This man penetrated to your very door by their convenience. He bore a letter which I had intercepted. I have brought him here that your majesty may no longer think my seal excessive. I will question him, said the king, staring in his chair. He looked at David with heavy eyes, dulled by an opaque film. The poet bent his knee. From where do you come? asked the king. From the village of Arnoy, in the province of Eret Lor, sire. What do you follow in Paris? I, I would be a poet, sire. And what did you do in Bernoy? I minded my father's flock of sheep. The king stared again, and the film lifted from his eyes. Ah, in the fields. Yes, sire. You lived in the fields. You went out in the cool of the morning and lay among the hedges in the grass. The flock distributed itself upon the hillside. You drank of the living stream. You ate your sweet brown bread in the shade. And you listened, doubtless, to blackbirds piping in the grove. Is that not so, the shepherd? It is, sire, answered David with a sigh and to the bees and the flowers, and maybe to the grape gather singing on the hill. Yes, yes, said the king impatiently, maybe to them, but surely to the blackbirds. They whistled often in the grove, did they not? Nowhere, sire, so sweetly as in Ur and Lor. I have been dowered to express their song in some verses I have written. Can you repeat those verses? asked the king eagerly. A long time ago I listened to the blackbirds. It would be something better than a kingdom if one could rightly construe their song. And at night you drove the sheep to the fold and then sat in peace and tranquility to your pleasant bread. Can you repeat those verses, shepherd? They ran like this, sire, said David, with a respectful adore. Lazy shepherd, see your lambkins. Skip ecstatic on the mead. See the first dance in the breezes. Hear Pan blowing at his reed. Hear us calling from the treetops. See us swoop upon your flock. Yield us wool to make our nest warm in the branches of the... If it please your majesty interrupted a harsh voice. I will ask a question or two of this remaster. There is little time to spare. I crave pardon, sire, if my anxiety for your safety offends. The loyalty, said the king, of the Duke de Mont is too well proven to give offense. He sank into his chair and the film came again over his eyes. First, said the Duke, I will read you the letter he brought. Tonight is the anniversary of the Dauphin's death. If he goes as his custom to midnight mass to pray for the soul of his son, the falcon will strike at the corner of the Rue Esplandale. If this be his intention, set a red light in the upper room at the southwest corner of the palace, that the falcon may take heed. Peasant, said the duke sternly, you have heard these words. Who gave you this message to bring? My Lord Duke, said David sincerely, I will tell you. A lady gave it me. She said her mother was ill and that this writing would fetch her uncle to her bedside. I do not know the meaning of the letter. 
but I will swear that she is beautiful and good. Describe the woman, commanded the duke, and how you came to become her dupe. Describe her, said David with a tender smile. You would command words to perform miracles. Well, she is made of sunshine and deep shade. She is slender like the alders and moves with her grace. Her eyes change while you gaze into them, now round and then half shut, as the sun peeps between two clouds. When she comes, heaven is all about her. When she leaves, there is chaos and a scent of hawthorn blossoms. She came to me in the Rue Conti, number 29. It is the house, said the duke, turning to the king, that we have been watching. Thanks to the poet's tongue, we have a picture of the infamous Countess Quebedo. Sire, and my lord duke, said David earnestly, I hope my poor words have done no injustice. I have looked into that lady's eyes. I will stake my life she's an angel, letter or no letter. The duke looked at him steadily. I will put you to the proof he said slowly. Dressed as the king, you shall yourself attend mass in his carriage at midnight. Do you accept the test? David smiled. I have looked into her eyes, he said. I have my proof there. Take yours how you will. Half an hour before twelve, the Duc d'Amont with his own hands set a red lamp in the southwest window of the palace. At ten minutes to the hour, David leaned on his arm, dressed as the king from top to toe, with his head bowed in his cloak, walked slowly from the royal apartments to the waiting carriage. The duke assisted him inside and closed the door. The carriage whirled away along its route to the cathedral. On the qui vive at the house at the corner of the Rue Esplande was Captain Tetreau with twenty men ready to pounce upon the conspirators when they should appear. But it seemed that, for some reason, the plotters had slightly altered their plans. When the royal carriage had reached the Rue Christopher, one square nearer than the Rue Esplanade, Forth from it burst Captain de Rose with his band of would-be regicides, and assailed the compage. The guards upon the carriage, though surprised at the premature attack, descended and fought valiantly. The noise of conflict attracted the force of the captain to throw, and they came pleading down the street to the rescue. But in the meantime, the desperate de Rose had torn open the door of the king's carriage, thrust his weapon against the body of the dark figure inside, and fired. Now, with royal reinforcement at hands, the street rang with cries and the rasps of steel, but the frightened horses had dashed away. Upon the cushion lay the dead boy of a poor mock king and poet, slain by a ball from the pistol of Monsieur, the Marquis de Buberti. The Main Road Three leagues, then, the road ran and turned into a puzzle. It joined with another and a larger road at the right angles. David stood uncertain for a while, and then sat himself to rest upon its side. Whither those roads led, he knew not. Either way, there seemed to lie a great world of full of chance and peril. And then, sitting there, his eye fell upon a bright star, one that he and Yvonne had named for theirs. That set him thinking of Yvonne, and he wondered if he hadn't been too hasty. Why should he leave her and his home because a few hot words had come between them? Was love such bridal a thing that jealousy, the very proof of it, could break it? Morning always brought a cure for the little heartaches of evening. There was yet time for him to return home without anyone in the sweetly sleeping village of Renoy being the wiser. His heart was Yvonne's. 
There where he had lived always, he could write his poems and find his happiness. David rose and shook off his unrest and the wild mood that had tempted him. He set his face steadfastly back the way that he had come. By the time he had retraveled the road to Vernoy, his desire to rove was gone. He passed the sheepfold, and the sheep scurried with a drumming flutter at his late footsteps, warming his heart by the homely sound. He crept without noise into his little room and lay there, thankful that his feet had escaped the distress of new roads that night. How well he knew woman's heart. The next evening Yvonne was at the well in the road where the young conjugated in order that the cure might have business. The corner of her eye was engaged in a search for David, albeit her set mouth seemed unrelenting. He saw the look, braved the mouth, drew from it a recantation, and later a kiss as they walked home together. Three months afterwards, they were married. David's father was shrewd and prosperous. He gave them a wedding that was heard of three leagues away. Both the young people were favorites in the village. There was a procession in the street, a dance on the green. They had the marionettes and tumbler out from Durow to delight in the guests. Then a year, and David's father died. The sheep and the cottage descended to him. He already had the seemliest wife in the village. Yvonne's milk pails and her grass kettles were bright. Ugh, they blinded you in the sun when he passed that way. But you must keep your eyes open, for her flower beds were so neat and gay, they were stored to your sight. And you might hear her sing, I, as far as the double chestnut tree above Père Grenaud's blacksmith forge. But a day came when David drew out paper from a long shot drawer and began to bite the end of a pencil. Spring had come again and touched his heart. Poet he must have been, for now Yvonne was well yet forgotten. This fine new loveliness of earth held him with its witchery and grace. The perfume from her woods and meadows stirred him strangely. Daily had he gone forth with his flock and brought it safe at night, but now he stretched himself under the hedge and pierced worlds together on his bits of paper. The sheep strayed, and the wolves, perceiving that difficult poems make easy muttons, ventured from the woods and stole his lambs. David's stock of poems grew larger and his flock smaller. Yvonne's nose and temper waxed sharp and her talk blunt. Her pants and kettles grew dull, but her eye had caught their flash. She pointed out to the poet that his neglect was reducing the flock and bringing woe upon the household. David hired a boy to guard the sheep, locked himself in a little room in the top of the cottage, and wrote more poems. The boy, being a poet by nature, but not furnished with an outlet in the way of writing, spent his time in slumber. The wolves lost no time in discovering that poetry and sleep are practically the same, so the flock steadily grew smaller. Yvonne's ill temper increased at an equal rate. Sometimes she would stand in the yard and rail at David through his high windows. Then you could hear her as far as the double chestnut tree above Pierre Grenaud's forge. M. Papineau, the kind, wise, meddling old notary, saw this as he saw everything at which his nose pointed. He went to David, fortified himself with a great pinch of snuff, and said, Friend Mignot, I affixed the seal upon the marriage certificate of your father. It would distress me to be obliged to attest a paper signifying the bankruptcy of his son. But that is what you are coming to. I speak as an old friend. Now listen to what I have to say. You have your heart set, I perceive, upon poetry. 
At the row, I have a friend, one Monsieur Bru, George Bru. He lives in a little clear space in a house full of books. He is a learned man. He visits Paris every year. He himself has written books. He will tell you when the catacombs were made, how they found out the names of the stars, and why the flower has a long bill. The meaning and the form of poetry is to him as intelligent as the ball of a sheep is to you. I will give you a letter to him, and you shall take him your poems and let him read them. Then you shall know if you should write more, or give your attention to your wife and business. Write the letter, said David. I'm sorry you didn't speak of this sooner. At sunrise next morning, he was on the road to the Rau, with a precious roll of poems under his arm. At noon, he wiped the dust from his feet at the door of Monsieur Breau. That learned man broke the seal of M. Papineau's letter and sucked up its content through its gleaming spectacles as the sun draws water. He took David inside to his study and set him down upon a little island beat upon by a sea of books. Monsieur Brill had a conscience. He flinched not even at a mass of manuscript, the thickness of the finger length, and rolled to an incorrigible curve. He broke the back of the roll against his knee and began to read. He slighted nothing. He bored into the lump as a worm into a nut, seeking for a kernel. Meanwhile, David sat marooned, trembling in the spray of so much literature. It roared in his ears. He held no chart or compass for voyaging in that sea. Half the world, he thought, must be writing books. Monsieur Brill bored to the last page of the poems. Then he took off his spectacles and wiped them with his handkerchief. My old friend, Poppy No, is well? he asked. In the best of health, said David. How many sheep have you, Monsieur Minot? Three hundred and nine when I counted them yesterday. The flock has had ill fortune. To that number it decreased from eight hundred and fifty. You have a wife and a home? and lived in comfort. The sheep brought you plenty. You went into the fields with them, and lived in the keen air, and ate the sweet bread of contentment. You had but to be diligent, and recline there upon nature's breast, listening to the whistle of the blackbirds in the grove. Am I right thus far? It was so, said David. I have read all your verses, continued Monsieur Brou, his eyes wandering about his sea of books as if he conned the horizon for a sail. Look yonder, through that window, Monsieur Minot. Tell me what you see in that tree. I see a crow, said David, looking. There is a bird, said Monsieur Brou, that shall assist me where I am disposed to shirk a duty. You know that bird, Monsieur Minot. He is the philosopher of the air. He is happy through submission to his lot. None so merry or full crown as he with his whimsical eye and rollicking staff. The fields yield him what he desires. He never grieves that his plumage is not gay like the orators. And you have heard, Monsieur Minot, the notes that the nature has given him. Is the nightingale any happier, you think? David rose to his feet. The crow cawed harshly from his tree. I thank you, Monsieur Brill, he said slowly. There was not, then, one nightingale note among all those croaks? I could not have missed it, said Monsieur Brill with a sigh. I read every word. Live your poetry, man. Do not try to write it any more. I thank you, said David again. And now I will be going back to my sheep. If you would dine with me, said the man of books, 
and overlook the smart of things. I will give you reasons at length. No, said the poet. I must be back in the fields, calling at my sheep. Back along the road to Renoy, he trudged with his poems under his arms. When he reached his village, he turned into the shop of one Ziegler, a Jew out of Armenia, who sold anything that came to his hand. Friend, said David, wolves from the forest harass my sheep on the hills. I must purchase firearms to protect them. What have you? A bad day this for me, friend Minot, said Siegler, spreading his hands, for I perceive that I must sell you a weapon that will not fetch a tenth of its value. Only last week I bought from a peddler a wagon full of goods that he procured at a sale by a commissioner of the crown. The sale was of the chateau and belongings of a great lord, I know not his title, who has been banished for conspiracy against the king. There are some choice firearms in the lot. This pistol, oh, a weapon fit for a prince. It shall be only forty francs to you, friend Mignot, if I lose ten by the sale, but perhaps an arquebus. This will do, said David, throwing the money at the counter. Is it charged? I will charge it, said Ziegler, and for ten francs more, add a store of powder and ball. David laid his pistol under his coat and walked to his cottage. Yvonne was not there. Of late she had taken to gaddling much among the neighbors, but a fire was glowing in the kitchen stove. David opened the door of it and thrust his poems in upon the coal. As they blazed up, they made a singing harsh sound in the flue. The song of the crow, said the poet. He went up to his attic room and closed the door. So quiet was the village, but a score of people heard the roar of the great pistol. They flocked thither and up the stairs where the smoke issuing drew their notice. The man laid the body of the poet upon his bed, awkwardly arranging it to conceal the torn plumage of the poor black crow. The women chatted in luxury of Celia's pity. Some of them ran to tell Yvonne. M. Papineau, whose nose had brought him there among the first, picked up the weapon and ran his eyes over its silver mountings with a mingled air of connoisseurship and grief. The arms, he explained aside to the cure, and chest of Monsieur, the Marquis, the Beaufortese. de Maupassant, his short story called Two Friends. Besieged Paris was in the throes of famine. Even the sparrows on the roofs and the rats in the sewers were growing scarce, and people were eating anything they could get. As Monsieur Marizzo, watchmaker by profession and idler for the nonce, was strolling along the boulevard one bright January morning, his hands in his trouser pocket and his stomach empty, he suddenly came face to face with a friend, Monsieur Sauvage, a fishing companion. Before the war broke out, Marizzo had been in the habit every Sunday morning of setting forth with a bamboo rod in his hand and a tin box on his back. He took the Argentine train, got out at Colombe, and walked thence to the Isle Mirande. The moment he arrived at this place of his dreams, he began fishing and stayed till nightfall. Every Sunday he met at this spot Monsieur Sauvage, a stout, jolly little man, a draper in the Rue Notre Dame de Lorette, and also an ardent fisherman. They often spent half the day side by side, rod in hand and feet dangling over the water, and a sincere friendship sprung up between the two. Some days they did not speak, at other times they chatted, but they understood each other perfectly without the aid of word, having similar tastes and feelings. In the spring, about ten o'clock in the morning, when the early sun caused the light mist to float on the water 
and gently warmed the backs of the two enthusiastic anglers, Marissa would occasionally remark to his neighbor, Isn't it pleasant here? To which the other would reply, I can't imagine anything better. And these few words suffice to make them understand and appreciate each other. In the autumn, towards the close of day, when the setting sun shed a blood-red color over the western sky, and the reflection of the crimson clouds tinged the whole river, brought a glow to the faces of the two friends and gilded the trees, whose leaves were already turning at the first chill touch of winter, Monsieur Sauvage would sometimes smile at Marizzo and say, What a glorious spectacle! And Marissa would answer, without taking his eyes from his float, This is much better than the boulevard, isn't it? As soon as they recognized each other, they shook hands cordially, affected at the thought of meeting in such changed circumstances. Monsieur Sauvage, with a sigh, murmured, These are sad times. Marissa shook his head mournfully. And such weather! This is the first fine day of the year. The sky was, in fact, of a bright, cloudless blue. They walked along, side by side, reflective and sad. And to think of the fishing, said Marizzo. What good times we used to have! When shall we be able to fish again? asked Monsieur Sauvage. They entered a small café, took an absinthe together, and then resumed their walk along the pavement. Marizzo stopped suddenly. Shall we have another absinthe? he said. If you like, agreed Monsieur Sauvage, and they entered a wine shop. They were quite unsteady when they came out, owing to the effect of the alcohol on their empty stomachs. It was a fine, mild day, and a gentle breeze fanned their faces. The fresh air completed the effect of the alcohol on Monsieur Sauvage. He stopped suddenly, saying, Suppose we go there. Where? Fishing. But where? Why, the old place. The French outposts are close to Cologne. I know Colonel de Merlin, and we shall easily get leave to pass. Marizzo trembled with desire. Very well, I agree. And they separated to fetch their rods and lines. An hour later, they were walking side by side on the high road. Presently, they reached the villa occupied by the Colonel. He smiled at their request and granted it. They resumed their walk, furnished with a password. Soon they left the outpost behind them, made their way through a deserted Cologne, and found themselves on the outskirts of a small vineyard which bordered the sign. It was about eleven o'clock. Before them lay the village of Argenté, apparently lifeless. The heights of Armand and San Juan dominated the landscape. The great plain, extending as far as Nantre, was empty, quite empty, a waste of dun-colored soil and bare cherry trees. Monsieur Sauvage, pointing to the heights, murmured, The Prussians are up yonder. And the sight of the deserted country filled the two friends with vague misgivings. The Prussians, they had never seen them as yet, but they had felt their presence in the neighborhood of Paris for months past, ruining France, pillaging, massacring, and starving the people. And a kind of superstitious terror was added to the hatred they already felt towards this unknown victorious nation. Suppose we were to meet any of them, said Marizzo. We'd offer them some fish, replied Monsieur Sauvage, with that Prussian light-heartedness which nothing can wholly quench. Still, they hesitated to show themselves in the open country. Overawed, 
by the utter silence which reigned around them. At last Monsieur Savage said boldly, Come, we'll make a start, only let us be careful. And they made their way through one of the vineyards, bent double, creeping along beneath the cover afforded by the vines, with eye and ear alert. A strip of bare ground remained to be crossed before they could gain the river bank. They ran across this, and, as soon as they were at the water's edge, concealed themselves amongst the dry reeds. Marizzo placed his ear to the ground to ascertain, if possible, whether footsteps were coming their way. He heard nothing. They seemed to be utterly alone. Their confidence was restored, and they began to fish. Before them, the deserted Isle Marante hid them from the further shore. The little restaurant was closed and looked as if it had been deserted for years. Monsieur Sauvage caught the first gudgeon, Monsieur Marizzo the second, and almost every moment one or other raised his line with a little glittering silvery fish wriggling at the end. They were having excellent sport. They slipped their catch gently into a close mashed bag, lying at their feet. They were filled with joy. The joy of once more indulging in a pastime of which they had long been deprived. The sun poured its rays on their backs. They no longer heard anything or thought of anything. They ignored the rest of the world. They were fishing. But suddenly, a rumbling sound, which seemed to come from the bowels of the earth, shook the ground beneath them. The cannons were resuming their thunder. Marizzo turned his head and could see towards the left, beyond the banks of the river, the formidable outline of Mont Lorrain, from whose summit arose a white puff of smoke. The next instant, a second puff followed the first, and in a few moments, a fresh detonation made the earth tremble. Others followed, and minute by minute, the mountain gave forth its deadly breath and a white puff of smoke, which rose slowly into the peaceful heaven and floated above the summit of the cliff. Monsieur Sauvage shrugged his shoulders. They are at it again, he said. Marizzo, who was anxiously watching his float bobbing up and down, was suddenly seized with the angry impatience of the peaceful man towards the madmen who were firing thus, and remarked indignantly, What fools they are to kill one another like that! They're worse than animals, replied Monsieur Sauvage, and Marizzo, who had just caught a bleak, declared, and to think that it will be just the same as long as there are governments. The Republic would not have declared war, interposed Monsieur Sauvage. Marizzo interrupted him. Under a king we have foreign wars. Under a Republic we have civil wars. And the two began placidly discussing political problems with the sound common sense of peaceful, matter-of-fact citizens, agreeing on one point, that they would never be free. And mont thundered ceaselessly, demolishing the houses of the French with its cannonballs, grinding lives of men to powder, destroying many a dream, many a cherished hope, many a prospective happiness, ruthlessly causing endless woe and suffering in the hearts of wives, of daughters, of mothers, in other regions. Such is life, declared Monsieur Sauvage. Say, rather such is death, replied Marizzo, laughing. But they suddenly trembled with alarm at the sound of footsteps behind them and, turning round, they perceived close at hand 
four tall, bearded men, dressed after the manner of liveried servants, and wearing flat caps on their heads. They were covering the two anglers with their rifles. The rod slipped away from their owner's hands and floated down the river. In the space of a few seconds, they were seized, bound, and thrown into a boat and taken across the Isle Marant. And behind the house they had fought deserted were about a score of German soldiers. A shaggy-looking giant who was bestriding a chair and smoking a long clay pipe addressed them in excellent French with these words. Well, gentlemen, have you had good luck with your fishing? Then a soldier deposited at the officer's feet the bag full of fish, which he had taken care to bring away. The Prussian smiled. Not bad, I see. But we have something else to talk about. Listen to me and don't be alarmed. You must know, in my eyes, you are two spies sent to report my movements. Naturally, I capture you and I shoot you. You pretend to be fishing, the better to disguise your real errand. You have fallen into my hands and must take the consequences. Such is war. But as you come here through the outpost, you must have a password for your return. Tell me that password and I will let you go. The two friends, pale as death, stood silently side by side. A slight fluttering of the hands alone betrayed their emotion. No one will ever know, continued the officer. You will return peacefully to your homes, and the secret will disappear with you. If you refuse, it means death, instant death. Choose. They stood motionless and did not open their lips. The Prussian, perfectly calm, went on, with hand outstretched towards the river. Just think that in five minutes you will be at the bottom of that river. In five minutes. You have relations, I presume? Montvarin still thundered. The two fishermen remained silent. The German turned and gave an order in his own language. Then he moved his chair a little way off, that he might not be so near the prisoners while a dozen men stepped forward, rifles at the ready, and took up a position at twenty paces off. I give you one minute, said the officer, not a second longer. Then he rose quickly, went over to the two Frenchmen, took Marizzo by the arm, led him a short distance off, and said in a low voice, Quick, the password. Your friend will know nothing. I will pretend to relent. Marisa answered not a word. Then the Prussian took Monsieur Sauvage aside in a like manner and made him the same proposal. Monsieur Sauvage made no reply. Again they stood side by side. The officer issued his orders. The soldiers raised their rifles. Then, by chance, Marizzo's eyes fell on the bag full of gudgeon lying in the grass a few feet from him. A ray of sunlight made the still quivering fish glisten like silver. And Marizzo's heart sank. Despite his effort at self-control, his eyes filled with tears. Goodbye, Monsieur Sauvage, he faltered. Goodbye, Monsieur Marizzo, replied Sauvage. They shook hands, trembling from head to foot with a dread beyond their mastery. The officer cried, Fire! 
and the twelve shots were as one. Monsieur Sauvage fell forward instantaneously. Marizzo, being the taller, swayed slightly and fell across his friend with face turned skyward and blood oozing from a rent in the breast of his coat. The German issued fresh orders. His men dispersed and presently returned with ropes and large stones, which they attached to the feet of the two friends. Then they carried them to the river bank. Mont Varin, its summit now enshrouded in smoke, continued to thunder. Two soldiers took Marizzo by the head and feet. Two others did the same with Sauvage. The bodies, swung vigorously by strong hands, were cast to a distance and, describing a curve, fell feet foremost into the stream. The water splashed high, foamed, eddied, and then was still again. Tiny waves lapsed the shore. A few streaks of blood flecked the surface of the river. The officer, calm throughout, remarked with grim humor, It's the fish's turn now. Then he retraced his way to the house. Suddenly he caught sight of the net full of gudgeon, lying forgotten in the grass. He picked it up, examined it, smiled and called, Wilhelm! A white prone soldier responded to the summons, and the Prussian, tossing him the catch of the two dead men, said, Have this fish fried for me at once, while they're still alive. They'll make an excellent dish. Then he relit his pipe. The end. Anton Chekhov. It was just called without a title. In the 15th century, as now, the sun rose every morning and sank to rest every night. When its first rays kissed the dew, the earth awoke and the air was filled with sounds of joy, ecstasy, and hope. And at eventide, the same earth grew still and sank into darkness. Sometimes a thundercloud would roll up and the thunder roar angrily, or a sleepy star drop from heaven, or a pale monk come running in to tell the brothers that he had seen a tiger not far from the monastery, and that was all. And then once again, day would resemble day and night, night. The monks worked and prayed, and their old prior played the organ, composed Latin verses, and wrote out music. This fine old man had a remarkable talent. He played the organ with such skill that even the most ancient of the monks, whose hearings had grown feeble as the end of their lives drew near, could not restrain their tears when the notes of his organs came floating from his cell. When he spoke, even if it were only of the commonest things, such as trees and wild beasts or the sea, no one could listen to him without either a smile or a tear. The same notes seemed to vibrate in his soul that vibrated in the organ. When he was moved by wrath or great joy, when he spoke of things that were terrible and grand, a passionate inspiration would master him. Tears would start from his flashing eyes. His face would flush, his voice peal like thunder, and the listening monks would feel their souls wrung by his exultation. During these splendid, these marvelous moments, his power was unlimited. If he had ordered his elders to throw themselves into the sea, they would have all rushed rapturously with one accord to fulfill his desire. His music, his voice, and the verses with which he praised God were a source of never-ending joy to the monks. Sometimes in their monotonous lives, the trees, the flowers, the spring, the autumn, grew tiresome. The noise of the sea wearied them, and the songs of the birds grew unpleasing. 
but the talents of their old prior, like bread, they needed every day. A score of years passed, and day were simple day, and night night. Not a living creature showed itself near the monastery except wild beasts and birds. The nearest human habitation was far away, and to reach it from the monastery, or to reach the monastery from there, one had to cross a desert of hundred miles wide. This only those dared to do who set no value on life, who had renounced it, and joined the monastery as to a tomb. What then was the surprise of the monks when one night a man knocked at their gates who proved to be an inhabitant of the city, the most ordinary of sinners with a love for life? Before saying a prayer or asking the blessing of the prior, this man demanded food and wine. When they asked him how he had gotten to the desert from the city, he answered them by telling a long hunter's tale. He had gone hunting and had had too much to drink, and had lost his way. To the suggestion that he should become a monk and save his soul, he replied with a smile in the words, I am no friend of yours. Having eaten and drunk his fill, he looked long at the monks who were serving him, reproachfully shook his head and said, You don't do anything, you monks. All you care about is your rituals and drink. Is that the way to save your souls? Think now, while you are living quietly here, eating, drinking, and dreaming of blessedness, your fellow men are being lost and damned to hell. Look what goes on in the city. Some die of starvation, while others, not knowing what to do with their gold, plunge into debauchery and perish like flies and honey. There is no faith nor truth among men. Whose duty is it to save them? Is it mine, who am drunk from morning till night? Did God give you faith and loving and humble hearts that you should sit here between your four walls and do nothing? The drunken speech of the townsmen was insolent and unseemly, yet it strangely affected the prior. The old man and his monks looked at each other. Then he paled and said, Brothers, he is right. It is true that, owing to folly and weakness, unfortunate mankind is perishing in unbelief and sin, and we do not move from the spot as if it were no business of ours. Why should I not go and remind them of the Christ whom they have forgotten? The old man was transported by the words of the townsmen. On the following day he grasped his staff, bade farewell to the brothers, and set out for the city. So the monks were left without music, without his words and his verses. They waited first one month, and then two, and still the old men did not return. At last, at the end of the third month, they heard the familiar tapping of his staff. The monks flew out to meet him and showered him with questions, but instead of rejoicing with them, he wept bitterly and did not utter a word. The monks saw that he was thin and had aged greatly, and that weariness and profound sorrow were depicted on his face. When he wept, he had the look of a man who had been deeply hurt. Then the monks, too, burst into tears and asked why he was weeping and why his face looked so stern. But he answered not a word and went on and locked himself in his cell. For five days he stayed there, and neither ate nor drank, neither did he play the organ. When the monks knocked at his door and entreated him to come out and share his sorrow with them, his answer was a profound silence. At last he emerged. Collecting all the monks about him, with a face swollen with weeping and with many expressions of indignation and distress, he began to tell them all that had happened to him during the past three months. 
His voice was calm and his eyes smiled as he described his journey from monastery to the city. Birds had sung and brooks babbled to him by the wayside, he said, and sweet newborn hopes had agitated his breast. He felt that he was a soldier advancing to battle and certain victory. He walked alone dreaming, composing hymns and verses as he went, and was surprised when he found that he had reached his journey's end. But his voice trembled and his eyes flashed, and anger burned hot with him when he began to tell of the city and of mankind. Never before had he seen or dared to imagine what he encountered when he entered the town. Here, in his old age, he saw and understood for the first time in his life the might of Satan, the splendor of iniquity, and the weakness and despicable faint-heartedness of mankind. By an evil chance, the first house he entered was an abode of sin. Here, half a hundred men with a great deal of money were feasting and drinking wine without end. Overpowered by its fumes, they were singing songs and boldly saying things so shocking and terrible that no God-fearing men would dare to mention them. They were unboundedly free and happy and bold. They feared neither God, nor the devil, nor death did and said whatever they had a mind to, and went wherever they were driven by their desires. The wine, clear as amber, was surely intolerably fragrant and delicious, for every one who quaffed it smiled rapturously and straight away desired to drink again. It returned smile for smile and sparkled joyfully, as if it knew what fiendish seduction lay hidden in its sweetness. More than ever weeping and burning with anger, the old man went on describing what he had seen. On the table in the midst of the feasters, he said, stood a half-naked woman. It would be hard to imagine anything more glorious and enchanting than she was. Young, long-haired, with dark eyes and thick lips, insolent and shameless, this vermin smiled, showing her teeth as white as snow, as if saying, Behold, how beautiful, how insolent I am. Splendid draperies of silk and brocade fell from her shoulders, but her beauty would not be hidden beneath a garment and eagerly made its way through the folds, as young verdure forces itself through the earth in the springtime. The shameless woman drank wine, sang songs, and surrendered herself to the feasters. Wrathfully brandishing his arms, the old man went on to describe hippodromes, bullfights, theaters, and the workshops of artists where forms of naked women were painted and modeled in clay. He spoke eloquently, sonorously, with inspiration, as if he were playing on some invisible instrument, and the stupefied monks eagerly hung on to his words and panted with ecstasy. Having described all the charms of the devil, the beauty of wickedness, and the enchanting grace of the infamous female form, the old man cursed Satan, turned on his heel, and vanished behind his door. When he came out of his cell the next morning, not a monk remained in the monastery. They were all on their way to the city. Go the female form, huh? The end. <laughs>